Good boy. We Wait, can you hear me? I can hear you, Ryan. Oh, this is Joe. Oh, hi, Joe. I'm sorry, I thought you were Ryan. Good morning, Joe. Good. I, I can hear make, you. Just wanted to make sure my sound was working. Yep, all good. Great, thanks.
Good morning. So Brian, this is Cliff. Uh, uh, you do the first half and I do the second half, right? That's correct. All right, I got it down. Is there much talk about fire danger out there? I hear quite a bit in Colorado and California. Well, I mean, strangely enough, it actually might end up being low because it's been dry. There isn't much grass. Oh, <laughs> so that, that yeah. was, and the other thing, it's it's uh, it's a neutral year. Last year was a it was it was a La Nina year. La Nina mm -hmm. years tend to give us more of this offshore flow. So uh, I actually I think it might be better than That's normal. Great. Strangely great. enough, but uh, so we'll see. We'll see. I hear Western Colorado is pretty concerned. <laughs> Yeah, so keep our fingers crossed. Exactly. Uh, Brian, uh, this is Way. Did you see my email? Good morning, Way. Um, morning. No, I did not. Oh. Uh, what? Cliff, is that still true? You're going to present in Nick's paper? Yes, that's right. I'm, I'm all ready to do it. So I'm, okay. I'll, so. Yeah, that's what I'm letting uh, Brian know. Oh, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I am giving, I'm all ready to do it. <laughs> yeah, good, okay. After I do it, you may not want me to do it, but it's good. <laughs> can't take it back, yeah. Yeah. I'm having to have fun with this. So. Very good. Thank you. I see um, Tomer is here. Is Pedro here? I'm here. Too. Oh, good, good, thank you. And uh, what about Allison? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Good. <laughs> so, Brian, everybody for from the for the first session at least are here. So great. Mm. I'll start in a couple minutes. Yeah, give give it a couple more minutes. Yeah. Sure.
All right, it's 10 o'clock. Let's wait another, another minute or two here and then we'll get started with our first session. Yeah, uh, Ryan, if you can probably stop sharing and the Tomer then can bring up his slide. I'm sorry, can you say it again? Oh, you're fine. I'm asking uh, to, to take down the, the last slide and it has the first speaker oh, yeah. right. to bring up this slide. Yeah, we have Orion and Brian. I thought you said my name earlier. You said Brian. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what else. We'll have to check. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> well, one hit two, one word hit two, right? Anyway, uh, Tomer? Uh, yes, can you hear yes. me? Yes, can you bring, yeah, can you share your slides so that? Uh, yes. We, we, we'll we'll probably up. start in just man, one minute, but yeah. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, perfect. perfect. And should we put up the uh, Slido? Slido, link? yeah, I will do that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I will. All right, good morning, everyone. We're gonna start with our uh, first session um, on model applications, um, be presented by Tomer Berg, uh, discussing the impact of upstream tropopause polar vortex observations on the evolution of twin Arctic cyclones in June, 2020. And you have 20 minutes. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. So I'll be talking about some work that I've been currently working on as part of my PhD with uh, Stephen Cavallo at the University of Oklahoma. So to start off with some of my background for those that are not as familiar, a tropopause polar vortex, which I'll be referring to from here on ICTPV, is a coherent vortex along the tropopause. And there can be anticyclonic TPVs. For this purpose, I'll be referring to TPVs as cyclonic TPVs. And these are identified by a local minimum in temperature and dynamic tropopause height and a local maximum and potential vorticity. And these tend to occur primarily in high latitudes polar of the mid-latitude jet. So in this case, we have an example from January 2014. Where we're looking at the two PVU or dynamic tropopause potential temperature in the background. In this case, we can find two TPVs here as identified by a minimum in the potential temperature field, one in northern Canada and one in southeastern Canada. The vortices along the tropopause meet the definition of a TPV if they spend at least 60% of their lifetime polar of 65 degrees latitude and spend two or more days. And typically these can have fairly large range of size. They can range from as small as 100 kilometers up to 1000 kilometers and their lifetime can range as short as a day or two to as long as multiple months. And while these are primarily in the higher latitudes, they can be transported into the mid-latitudes with common pathways outwards, primarily over northern Canada and Siberia, in which case they can impact weather in North America, Europe, and Asia. So we may, may ask then, well, we, why should we care about TPVs? <clears throat> so these can have impacts on anything ranging from severe weather where a TPV entering the mid-latitudes can result in statistically significant patterns associated with uh, severe weather outbreaks. They're also associated with colder outbreaks, as I previously showed, where referring back to the example I initially showed of the January 2014 colder outbreak, the TPV that was over northern Canada was ultimately transported into the United States, resulting in a major colder outbreak that occurred. Another implication is Arctic cyclone, as TPVs often tend to precede Arctic cyclone or AC formation and at their peak intensity, they tend to be vertically coupled. And as we know, Arctic cyclones are associated with sea ice loss. So for all those reasons, improving our understanding of TPVs and their predictability will help us improve our understanding of these phenomena and our forecast of these phenomena. One of the biggest issues in Arctic meteorology is the sparse observations in the Arctic compared to lower latitudes. Or here we have an example figure from <clears throat> a window from 2010 showing that at that time, there are very few observations in the high latitudes. <clears throat> and even the few observations that we do have, for example, where we have radius on observations, 
the observations of moisture tend to be unreliable at cold temperatures, especially in the upper troposphere. And given that there's such low moisture that even a small uncertainty in moisture can have a big impact on the evolution. And accordingly, even rejecting a couple individual upper tropospheric moisture observations during data simulation can lead to large sensitivity in the forecast. And once a study, for example, data denial experiments show the importance of the Arctic on medium range forecast scale in the mid latitudes, where if we would, for example, for this study from data from 2019, if we withheld, withheld um, satellite data, this over the Arctic, this ultimately degraded the medium range forecast kill, especially over Northern Asia, as shown in the top right panel. But if we relax the forecast towards the operational analyses, this resulted specifically over the Arctic, as shown in the bottom panel, this resulted in an increase in forecast scale, both in the Arctic, but also extending into the mid latitudes. So this shows the importance of the Arctic overall on medium range predictability if going down into the mid latitudes. So the case I'm focusing on is occurred last year on June 19th, 2020, during which there was a pair of Arctic cyclones that was observed north of Canada, as you can see here. And what was particularly interesting to me about this case is if we look at the era five reanalysis, we can see that there are two Arctic cyclones. There is a Western one and the Eastern one. And both of these were associated with a TPV. Although if we compare it to the satellite image where both cyclones seem to be fairly intense, the MSLP analysis from the R5 analysis seems to show a slightly weaker Eastern Arctic cyclone compared to the Western Arctic cyclone or AC. And if we compare this to the operational ECMWF analysis based on the initialization at the, at the time, the Eastern AC actually seemed to be slightly weaker than the R5 analysis showed. And if we further compare this to the GFS analysis at the operational time, keep in mind that the map projection here is slightly different than the one I showed before, but the 996 hectopascal contour is actually even smaller than what was observed for the Eastern AC. And for the Western AC, the 988 contour is no longer apparent. So here, I'm going to be quickly going through a synoptic overview of the case. So we're looking at the 2 view potential temperature in the background and MSLP contours and the black lines. So in this case, we see the two TPVs I previously mentioned. The Western TP, the Eastern TPV as I'll be referring to here on is the TPV in the white or TPV1, and the Western TPV is the one highlighted in the yellow. So this is valid on June 10th, 2020. So as we step forward, we see that while the Western TPV kind of lingers around the Arctic Ocean and towards the Siberian side, the TPV, the Eastern TPV kind of slowly meanders its way over Alaska then gradually making its way into the Arctic Ocean, at which point, once we get closer to June 18th, now we see the two TPVs gradually coming closer into interaction with the, until we get to this time step of June 19th at 12Z, which is when the satellite image was valid. And we see the two TPVs and Arctic cyclones interacting with each other. And as we continue stepping forward to the Western TPV ends up, and Western AC ends up intensifying while phasing with the Eastern TPV resulting in a merge. And after this merge occurs, the, this complex gradually drifts towards the Siberian side. While at this point we see reintensification of the Arctic cyclone. So and eventually both kind of make their way towards the Siberian coast. So focusing again on the time frame valid at June 19th at 12Z, we can take a look at the operational EPS or ECMWF ensemble system forecast verification. So in this case, we're looking at the fraction of ensemble members that had potential temperature below 305 Kelvin. So at the analysis time, we do see the two TPVs very clearly highlighted. As we step a little bit forward, farther back in lead time, going towards forecast are 36 and 48. There's a little bit of a position variability as would be expected, but nothing too significant showing up. But once we go a little bit further beyond that towards forecast are 72 or lead time, while the Western TPV still appears to be fairly well modeled by the ensemble spread, we now see an increased position spread of the Eastern TPV, where some members do correctly have it further north, but there is an increasingly large subset of ensemble members that have it further south. And this split becomes increasingly evident as we go towards later lead times, at which point by the time we get to 108 hour lead time, the TPV closer to Greenland is no longer well defined in the ensemble spread. Ensemble members have it further north interacting with the North Western TPV, but other members actually have it incorrectly farther south over Canada, interacting with separate TPV to the south over Greenland. 
and this continues to become evident as we go further back in lead time. So one potential cause for this appears to be if we look a little bit earlier. So now we're focusing val on the times to validate June 18th at 12Z. The initialization again highlights where the TPPs are located at this time. But going back to 84 lead time, we see that most of the ensemble, or at least the larger share of the ensemble members had this TPV incorrectly tracking further south, which, went, which at that point results in a failed interaction with the TPV upstream over Siberia and instead an incorrect interaction with CPV or Greenland, thus affecting the entire Arctic cyclone evolution and failing to result in the observed twin AC evolution. In this case, it appears that a slight deviation of the TPV track once it moved off of Alaska ultimately had an inflection point, at which point it moved far south enough to that it failed to interact with the TPV. So this presents an opportunity to study the impact of the forecast scale of the CPV. So what was particularly notable about this case is that the Eastern TPV actually moved over three radio sun sites in the preceding days over Alaska, which makes this a candidate case for an observing system experiment, experiment or OC, or essentially did an L experiment. So if we come step forward, we see that this CPV slowly meandered almost directly over multiple radio sun sites, which allows for a great observation system of both the TPV structure itself, which we can see here, and this uh, sounding valid over uh, BAOT, where we see what we would expect to see on our TPV with the depressed tropopause around 400 millibars and a fairly weak tropospheric um, wind column. And this continues again as we go for forward, where the TPV ends up moving over the Barrow Alaska radius on site. And we see again that there is a depressed tropopause height, a little bit over 400 hectopascals, and very little wind in the troposphere and tropopause, indicating that the TPV is directly over this radio sun site. So the question then becomes if we, so the question becomes then how do these three radio sun sites affect the overall forecast scale and evolution of this case where if, say for example, we didn't have these radio sun sites, how would the forecast be degraded ultimately? So to set up this experiment, I'm using MPAS for the to set the experiment. The reason being that if we compare, for example, to say the WARF, the WARF has a basically a latitude longitude grid, which once we go towards higher latitudes, we end up getting to a singularity over the pole. So by using the impasse on structured mesh and the ultimately the ability for ever having a fine mesh as opposed to a hard boundary between the an inner nest like the WARF does, this allows us to avoid dealing with a singularity problem over the North Pole. So the setup I'm using, I'm using the 60 to 15 kilometer impasse mesh is rotated to be centered over the North Pole using the grid rotate program that was highlighted in the um, in the regional impasse workshop yesterday, or two days ago. I'm using the GEFS ensemble version 11 for the initial conditions. I'm using the new TIT key for the convection scheme, the double moment Thompson scheme for the microphysics, and the rest are the essentially the default for YC for the PPL scheme, NOAA land surface model, and RRTMG for radiation. And essentially I'm using uh, two sets of 30 member ensembles, which are initialized off of 48 and 54 hour forecast lead times for the GEFS to create sufficient initial, sufficient spread in the initial conditions. And these are spun up for 12 hours with the impasse to get the ensembles from the GFS state closer to the impasse mall state before beginning to do data simulation cycling. And for data simulation, I'm using the DART or the data simulation research testbed. And I'm using specifically the ensemble adjustment column parental filter or the EAKF. And DART provides a, a setting for working with impasse data for impasse ATM. So this is the setting that I'm using for DART. And while Unfortunately, this model is still currently running, so I do not have results. Things don't always work according to plan, especially in a year like this. So this simulation is still running, but ultimately to conclude this, what I'm working on is I'm essentially investigating this case for the two twin Arctic cyclones and the TPVs that are associated with it to analyze specifically the impact of the radio sounds over Alaska on the focus on the TPV. So this is what I'm currently working on and um, I'd be happy to take any questions or feedback or any thoughts that people have on this. 
Thank you very much, Tomer. Um, if there's any questions, yes, please, you can put some in Slido using the link that's posted, um, or you can raise your hand here. Are there any questions for Tomer? Yes, Mani, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. Hi, um, I just wanted to say that this is a good work, uh, good job. Um, but also uh, that uh, you said that you did, you did not use uh, WRF because of the uh, limitations that the mesh can have near the singularity near the pole uh, that you showed in one of your slides earlier. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, there is also the possibility that one can use uh, uh, polar stere stereographic projection uh, in WRF. Uh, wouldn't that solve the problem in WRF? I suppose it would. I mean, I'm not, uh, my background is not as much modeling as some of the other people here. So I'm sure some people would have better feedback. In my case, I'm specifically using the impasse given that it has, I mean, one of the advantages is that using the polar grid is that, I mean, the global grid, is that we also avoid having the problem of um, using LEP using a bandwidth yeah. condition. Okay, uh, just, I mean, just so as you know, if uh, you probably can solve that problem if you, use a, if you use a different projection for your grid in the WRF, uh, okay. but okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mani. Um, any other questions for Tomer? We have some, have some time. So again, you can raise your hand in the, uh, in the regular session, or you can post a question to there's a question Slido in the uh, link that was provided. Wade, uh, do you have a comment? Yeah, I do. Uh, maybe Tom, uh, uh, yes, you can probably use different projection uh, in work, but that's a limited area model still. Uh, do you have a sense why you need a global model, for instance, for this? Uh, study uh, rather than a regional model, I, I think. Uh, uh, even, even if you can use polar stere stereographic uh, projection in work, but that limited you from using a global version of the model. But you, do you see any reason to use a global model versus regional model, regional model for this study? In bit, the biggest advantage is um like I was um, saying earlier, is that um, by using global model, then we don't have to deal with uh, boundary conditions at the edge of the domain, which even with the regional, even in the regional impasse as we were talking yesterday, that the lateral boundary conditions are still something that can be factored in. So by using a global grid, we don't have to worry about boundary conditions or even in the wharf that you have to worry about conditions at the edge of the inner nest. All right, we have a question in uh, Slido. The PVU temperature you mentioned, is it the same as the potential vorticity or did you mean polar vortex? So, um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure, it was the PVU temperature you mentioned, is it the same as the potential vorticity or did you mean the polar vortex? So in this case, I'll, spec I'll um, specify the two PVU the two people refers to potential vorticity units or material potential vorticity. So in this case, this refers to where the drop pod would be located. So this differs from the polar vortex or PV. Or in this case, this is, or specifically in this case here, let's see if I can use the arrow to annotate. In this case here, in this case one circling, this would be the TPV of interest or the drop pod polar vortex. So this is a little bit more of a, um, a little bit goes outside of the scope of my talk, but there is a difference between the polar vortex and the Tobras polar vortex, where the polar vortex is higher up in the stratosphere and is a much larger feature than a Tobras polar vortex. So hopefully this answers the question. All right, thank you again, Tomer, for your presentation. Um, let's go ahead and move on to our, our next presentation. Um, it's by Pedro Jimenez at RELnet and CAR, and it's recent advances in the WARF solar model. 
So uh, Pedro, if you could share your screen. Okay. Can you, can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. So mm -hmm. now it should be in presenting mode. Yep, that looks perfect. Okay. And can you see my my arrow? Sure can. Yeah. Yep, it all looks good and we can see your arrow. All right, thank you. All right, so I'm going to um, provide an uh, overview of the current status of the World Solar Model and the ongoing developments. And I would like to thank thanks the rest of the World Solar team. Uh, the, the list is too long to explicitly uh, put it here, but thank you to all of them. The presentation, as I mentioned, is, uh, is divided into parts. The first one is uh, dealing with the current status of the model, and the second one with uh, ongoing developments and uh, some results that we are getting. So, World Solar are upgrades to work uh, to provide an appropriate numerical framework for solar energy applications. And in the original efforts, we focused on improving the feedback between radiation, clouds, and aerosols. This is a diagram that illustrates the, the parametrization that uh, we are using. So, we added a, a parametrization of the uh, aerosol optical properties can impose them to simulate the uh, direct effect of the aerosols. Jose Ruiz Arias, now in the University of Malaga, added this development. For the cloud aerosol feedback, we borrow the uh, aerosol uh, aware microphysics from uh, Craig and, and Truda. And we link it to radiation. And in that way, we were able to simulate both the direct and indirect uh, aerosol effects. In the cloud radiation uh, feedback, we have the uh, tens allocumulus parametrization to represent the radiative effects of the unresolved clouds. And finally, in the radiation part, uh, we added the uh, we added uh, funds and real collaborators developed this model, which is um, which provides a high temporal uh, uh, updates on the uh, surface irradiance, essentially every model time step we get the surface irradiances. All, the, all these developments uh, were progressively being added to the official world release, and all of them were included in, in the major world release of 2020, the version 4.2. Here I show you a snapshot of the World Solar website. It's an overview of the model, and here in the description, uh, in this tab, you can uh, look for information uh, about the parametrization that I described in the previous slide and, and other, uh, other parametrization or enhancement that we add. There is also a small user guide that provides technical details on how to activate these parametrizations in, in the work name list. The next step is uh, about uh, a reference configuration that we provide, and we are encouraging the users to use this configuration in the sensitivity experiment. So in this way, we will know how to improve or refine it and progressively make a uh, world solar prediction better. And also world solar uh, was added in, uh, the complete version were added in 4.2. There were some important uh, enhancements in, and we encourage users to use at least, <coughs> excuse me, to at least use version 4.22. Uh, it will be better to use the 4.3, the, the current uh, world release. Finally, there is also, I put here, there is also um, a block in the, in the world uh, forum. So you can, you can submit there your technical issues and, Hopefully, everybody can benefit uh, from the discussions there. We recently added a solar diagnostic package. Tim Giuliano from uh, did most of the work here. And in this packet, uh, when you activate it, uh, there are uh, two dimensional cloud and radiation variables in the, uh, in the standard world output. 
So it is activated by setting uh, solar diagnostic equal ones in the diax block of the name list. And if the user also activates the TS lead option, this is the option to output uh, time series at the selected locations, then all these two dimensional verbs are added, all, the, all these verbs are added at these uh, locations. These are the verbs that um, are added to the output. There's a complete list in this file. If you, can, if you would like to take a closer look. So there is a two dimensional cloud fraction, the integrated content of the hydrometeors. And here we have two versions because in one of them we added the unresolved hydrometeors uh, in this one. So here we can see what. Uh, then salocumulus parametrization uh, is uh, adding the contribution to the hydrometer, to radiation. And there is a set of uh, variables dealing with the effective radius of the hydrometeors, the cloud optical depth too, and some variables dealing with the characteristics of the uh, clouds, the, the cloud base and top heights. And finally, some variables dealing with radiation. And this includes the components of the radiance and also for clear sky and, and all sky conditions. In the, in the last version of WORF in 4.3, we added uh, the Mark World Now Casting System, which is designed to improve the World Solar Short Range predictions. Matt Worf built in our uh, experience with uh, the Matt Cast Now Casting System which is a, a satellite-based initialization system. And our experience is that uh, MATCAS, because of the cloud initialization using satellite information, has smaller errors than World Solar at the beginning of the forecast. But then MATCAS at best and diffuse the, the clouds are tracer. So the, the, there's no physics, so the errors grow with time. And on the other side, World Solar has much better physics, and, and the errors at the beginning tend to decrease. This is probably about six hours range. And uh, the idea is to, of MadWorf is to get the best of both models. So uh, we like to be in, uh, in this kind of uh, evolution. We have two flavors of MadWorf. Uh, in, in the first one, we're trying to mimic the MadCal behavior, and we refer to it as MadWorf passive. And after the clouds are initialized, we uh, advert and diffuse the hydrometeors. There's no cloud microphysics, so there are no cloud formation or evolution, so they are advetted, but they affect radiation. And then in, in the second version of MadWorf, that we refer to uh, MadWorf Active, um, we use this information, these uh, hydrometeors at the beginning. We advert them uh, like tracers, but uh, we nudge them uh, to the resolve hydrometeors. So in this way, the resolve hydrometeors are informed by these um, the tracers that uh, will help them to, to develop the uh, adequate environment to uh, sustain the clouds, at least in the beginning of the forecast. And then we stop nudging and, and, and we let the, the model evolve. These are some characteristics of uh, Matt Wolf. Uh, an important component is the uh, cloud initialization, parametrization. It was developed by Greg Thompson, and it's based on relative humidity. And uh, it's so it uses the relative humidity to identify the hydrometeors and where the clouds are. And it is also compatible with existing hydrometeors in the first guess. And then if there is a, if the user has a earth observations, we can impose these observations with the cloud mask or cloud top base height. Here we are mostly dealing, or what we have been working with is with the, the GOES cloud mask and GOES cloud top height. And the base comes from meter observation within the uh, US. And um, well, here are the two components that I mentioned, the passive mode that updates and diffuse the hydrometeos, and the active mode that uh, nudges the, uh, the tracers towards the model state. And typically, we, this nudging phase uh, lasts uh, about one hour. We've been running uh, World Solar and MadWorld 
passive and active for during a demonstration of the uh, potential of math world since February last year. And uh, we are running the model every hour and uh, the forecast length is six hours. And we focus over uh, the US. And the whole archive is available here from this uh, component of the group of uh, observation, geo, uh, the vision for energy, the geovener element. And the most recent forecast is available in, in the uh, MathWorks website that uh, you can take a look. I think here it's missing an, an F. <laughs> These are some results of the demonstration. And is the evaluation of the uh, US using ground observations from a multi month period. And you can see that the, the errors uh, behave as uh, our expected uh, a theoretical cube that I showed you before. So, uh, Madworth uh, shows a better uh, lower errors at the beginning due to the cloud initialization. This can be about 15%. Uh, improvement, which is substantial. And in passive mode, we see that the errors uh, increase as a function of the lead time. And the active mode is close at the beginning to the passive mode because of the nudging. But then it tends, when we stop nudging, it tends to convert uh, quicker than we expected towards the world solar behavior. So I think we need to do something more elaborated than just doing nudging to keep memory of these clouds. But then in, in the second part of the simulation, we see a differential that between World Solar and Mad World that uh, is positive. Uh, so Mad World tends to add value with respect to World Solar. And the model is available, as I said, since version 4.3. And there is documentation in this file in, in the source code. So you can see how to impose the Earth observations and activate the active and passive optimism. This is the, these are other ongoing developments on World Solar. There's a project uh, led by Enrel, where we are developing a probabilistic framework for World Solar, specifically tailored for solar applications. We refer to it as the World Solar Ensemble, Ensemble Prediction System, or World Solar EPS. And I will be talking more about it in the next slides. Here is another project, uh, this one led by PNNL, and the focus is in improving the, the physics. And uh, as part of this uh, project, uh, we added the solar diagnostic packets that I already mentioned. We are working to incorporate black carbon in the aerosol aware microphysics. This is an important aerosol that it was left out in the original implementation, but we are now working to add it back. And then there will be also a parameterization of the solar variability and some quantification of the uncertainty in the predictions to parameters of this parameterization. Arizona State University is incorporating an online parameterization of the PV panels uh, production and it effects on the atmosphere and the land uh, surface. And finally, this is another project, this one uh, led uh, by Brookhaven National Laboratory. They are working to enhance the world solar microphysics and to improve the representation of the direct irradiance and its interaction with, with clouds. So we should, um, the, all, all these uh, developments will be eventually added to the official uh, world release. So we should be able to enjoy them. And I'm going to talk in the next slides about uh, World Solar EPS because it's the one that I'm more actively involved. This project, the, the principal investigator is Managi Sengutta from Enred. And the, the main idea is to develop a, a probabilistic framework specifically tailored for solar energy application or for solar radiance predictions. So in the first phase, the development, we that's already completed. And we have identified the variables that are most relevant for the cloud formation, dissipation, and evolution. And, feedback to irradiance. So for that, we identified the variables developing tangent linear models of selected world solar modules, parametrizations. And once we have identified these variables, um, we uh, introduce stochastic perturbations on, on the variables every time step. 
And we added a, a very user-friendly framework so the user can have a, a absolute control of the characteristics of these perturbations and the variables that are being perturbed. So that's already complete. We are in the second phase where we are assessing the model performance. We are uh, configuring World Solar EPS and, and also um, exploring the benefits of a calibration of the ensemble, how much do we gain. This is the um, World Solar EPS website. It's very preliminary at this moment, but you can get uh, a flavor of what uh, World Solar will be. And the idea is to um, put the, the model in, in the next major release of WORF, the one in uh, 2022. And in this way, WORF Solar will be the first numerical weather predictor model specifically designed to provide probabilistic irradiant forecast. I have a couple of slides uh, dealing with the um, assessment. So here, just to illustrate that we are using ground observation, high quality ground observation of the US to evaluate the model performance. But also we are using satellite retrievals of the global horizontal irradiance. We are using the uh, retrievals from the National Solar Radiation Database that is being developed, uh, or it, it has been developed at time for a number of years. And this is a comparison. This diagram compares the performance of the uh, the, this database, the NSFDB, against ground observations as well as uh, uh, against, sorry, against World Solar, but also there are uh, there is a comparison against World Solar and ground observations. This is the shaded line, World Solar versus NSFDB, the satellite, and the gray line is World Solar versus the uh, ground observations. So you can see that uh, the satellite retrievals are in close agreement with uh, the error from the ground observations. It tends to um, to underestimate the error a bit uh, systematically, but it reproduces the spatial variability uh, of the error, which is which is desirable. So if we we use this data set, the satellite retrieval, we can get this kind of uh, evaluations. This is the the root mean square error of the day ahead. Uh, global horizontal irradiance predictions for the whole year of 2018. And here in, in this panel, you can see the results for World Solar using the reference configuration that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation. And you can see, for example, that uh, the errors are lowest in California. That's probably because of the more predominantly uh, clear skies here, and they are higher uh, towards the uh, western or the eastern uh, US. When we use the World Solar EPS, we reduce these errors. But we should be we should be cautious because interpreting the result because this is an ensemble average which smooths the output and it tends to provide uh, better results. So we are comparing the prediction for World Solar EPS with other ensemble uh, configuration, physics and stochastics uh, ensemble. And finally, here you can see an example example of uh, the kind of improvements that we will expect uh, after calibrating the ensemble. In this case, we are using a methodology based on analogs to calibrate the ensemble. So you compare the error from the original uh, World Solar, the deterministic versions, to the calibrating ensemble. We can get improvements by uh, larger than 50%. So that points that uh, we should probably go in this direction ensemble predictions and calibration to improve the irradiance of the deterministic forecast. So in summary, um, World Solar is designed to provide a, an appropriate numerical framework for a solar irradiance uh, forecast. Main developments focused in improving the representation of the aerosol cloud radiation, and there are ongoing developments to enhance the, further enhance this physics and to provide probabilistic forecast, the World Solar EPS. And in the short range uh, predictions, we can use uh, MatWolf to improve the radiance in the first hours of the simulation. So you have questions, if they are technical, you can submit them to the web forum. So we can um, benefit, uh, the user can benefit from the discussions there. And with any other feedback, you can always send me an email here. Here is my email. So that's all I have, uh, I'll take questions.
Thank you, Pedro. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, Wayne, if you could unmute yourself. Yeah, Pedro, it looked like the statistics you were showing were uh, for a whole year, for example, for each of those sites. Um, have you thought about evaluating based on the cloud regime? In other words, it's probably, you probably have different errors in shallow cumulus or in summertime than you have in wintertime, um, you know, larger scale cloud systems. Yes, yeah, you are, that's, that's my feeling too. I, I agree with, with the comment. We didn't look at that. That would be, um, that would be uh, worth to do. We can probably address that based on uh, the satellite classification. We get a classification of the clouds. So we can take a look to uh, how the model performs under these uh, classifications. That shouldn't be, um, that shouldn't be, that should be achievable. I think so. We should probably take a look to that. On on that direction, we on indirect uh, direction, uh, looking at this, we have seen that the errors of the model uh, depends on the change during the season. So I saw the the aggregation over multiple months, but if you take uh, a look to different seasons, the picture changes, and also uh, within US, uh, that picture also changes and. And we are taking a, a closer look to that uh, uh, at the time and, and speaking. So at least we'll have uh, that characterization that should help to um, to quantify somehow the impact of the different clouds. Okay, we have time for one more quick question. Uh, Dave Stoffer, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, Pedro. Hi, nice job. I just wonder if uh, AJ shall accumulate scheme uh, it's now scale where, I assume? Are you running at three kilometers? What is your grid resolution for everything you're showing at? So this simulation, we are using nine kilometers nine. Because, because we are running an ensemble for... Okay. I saw, I has saw, has, has your group made uh, the shallow Q scheme scale where? Yeah, yes. not, well, what, what grid resolution are you comfortable running it down to? So... I can say something about that. I didn't show it here, but in uh, we have also uh, uh, run uh, run the dense halo cumulus at three kilometers, and over the contiguous uh, US over this whole domain. And for a number of years, I think uh, of months, sorry, I think we ran it for a multi summer. I ran it for a multi summer season, and. Uh, I forgot about the details, but the the main uh, the summary is that uh, well we don't know if it is worth it right to activate uh, the shallow cumulus at that resolution because it was tends to start resolving some of these uh, uh, smaller clouds. But the 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 summary of what we found uh, is that it is worth it to activate it uh, then shallow cumulus at three kilometers. I think if if we didn't activate the these parametrizations, we lost. Uh, it wasn't so worth it to run at three kilometers. So we we re, we went back a little bit towards the result that we we're getting at uh, nine kilometers. And did you have plans to make it aerosol aware? The tanks, salo cumulus. Yeah, that's not in our uh, in our short path at this moment. All right, thank you very much, Pedro. We need to need to move on. If there's any other questions, please uh, contact Pedro directly. Um, our uh, third talk um, being given by Cliff Mass for Nick Weber is tropical convection and sub-seasonal weather prediction in a global convection permitting model. So presented by Cliff Mass. Okay, I can't, uh, I have to, you have to release it for me. Okay, I got it. Okay. There we go. We you got it. it? Yep. We see your screen. You see my screen? Okay. Yep. Looks good. Excellent. Let's let's get going. Uh, I'm filling in for Nick Weber, who can't who can't give the presentation, unfortunately. So I'll do the I'll do the best I can. Uh, he got his PhD at the UW doing this work uh, last year. Okay. So let me just get this back on. Okay. So the motivation for this. Uh, one thing is clear, you know, global forecasts are degraded by poorly simulated 
uh, tropical convection, we know that. Uh, large scale tropical variability like Kelvin waves are, are not well captured in the tropics. And there are clearly division simulation of important processes with implications on the global scale. So anyway, that, you know, that, that's the main motivation of these things. So the question is, how can we improve simulated convection in the tropics? Uh, and you know, one way is to improve cumulus parameterizations, but another approach, if you have the computer power, is to use a convection permitting model either globally or, or over the tropics. Okay, so convection permitting models, CPMs, you know, they can more realistically simulate you know, tropical convection, hopefully, uh, but they have high computational cost. And because they're so expensive, there are certain compromises that are often made. Uh, often the resolution is in the gray zone, you know, eight, eight, seven, eight, nine kilometers, which are problematic. Um, you might use a small domain, short integrations. There are compromises that have been made. So what I'm gonna talk about here in this talk is not making compromises. And, you know, just like Clint Eastwood wouldn't compromise. And I'm going to show you various configurations of, of MPAS run globally, and I'm going to show you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay, so I'm going to show you some no compromise experiments. And I'm going to show you, uh, this is the stuff that, uh, that Nick had done, extended running of MPAS at high resolution, convective permitting resolution, okay, over an extended period, and these are going to be one month simulations. There aren't that many of such simulations in literature, and we're also going to look at the potential for improving prediction weeks to a month ahead of time. Um, the nice thing about this is when you run convection permitting over the whole globe, you not only get the convection better here, but you, know, you get convection you know, in, in the mid-latitudes better, you get the teleconnections better. Okay, so let's talk about the simulations that we're going to be using MPAS version five. Um, we're going to use the convection permitting suite of physics. Uh, the GFS is used for the analysis. One thing we're doing, and this is a compromise, we're using sea surface temperatures that are fixed at the initial value. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about four cases we run for 28 days. Um, and, and one of them is a dynamo case, so that you can see the, 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 the years there. So these are four runs at 28 days at convection permitting resolution and more. So let me tell you about the configurations that we have uh, for comparison. Uh, one is running 15 kilometers globally um, using the, the uh, Chetky cumulus scheme. We're going to call this M15. So this is 15 kilometer grid, uh, grid spacing using a cumulus parameterization. This is like where we are today. Then M3 using three kilometer resolution globally with no cumulus scheme at all. Okay, no, no deep convection scheme. Then 15 kilometer resolution with no cumulus scheme. What does that do? Okay, so just run 15 kilometers and, and resolve what you can. And then finally for one of the runs, what we did was run 15 kilometers in the mid latitudes and the polar regions, grading down to three kilometers in a tropical channel. And you know we made we took advantage of the Grell Friedis uh, scale aware you know cumulus scheme to allow us to have in one run going from 15 to three. To, this is a way of trying to save 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 computer resources by having this channel three kilometer channel, but 15 kilometers in the mid latitudes. So these are the runs. Okay, so keep these in mind. Okay, and for verification, um, we use uh, satellite data like TRIM, and we also use the, the ERA-5 reanalysis. Now, just to give you an idea, people often ask, how much does this cost? Uh, we ran this on Cheyenne, um, 37,000 nodes. Um, for each run, 2.7 million core hours, uh, and it put out at about 80 terabytes of, of gridded information. So the, this, is, this is the cost of this thing. Okay, so here we go. You know, everybody has to do this, who does this kind of run. Is this satellite or is this model? Well, you know, by the way, I'm asking that question. It's, this, this is model, but it looks pretty good. It, look, it, it looks realistic. 
Okay, so let's talk about precipitation statistics. And uh, this panel over here um, is the trim at the top. Okay, this is this is observations. Then then again, M15 is 15 kilometers uh, with parameterization, 15 kilometers with no cumulus parameterization, three kilometers here with uh, no cumulus parameterization and the channel run, okay? So, okay, so what I'm gonna show you here, some of the statistics, okay? And first for, for light precipitation. So here's reality. The convective parameterization with 15 kilometers, way too high, okay? Actually, the no 15 with no cumulus was better, uh, but certainly the three kilometer globally was was much better than the 15 kilometer with 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 parameterized cumulus uh, physics. Okay, moderate rain, similar story. There's trim, convective the 15 kilometer convective parameterization is has 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 too much, much better for for the three kilometer globally, and heavy precipitation. This is what this is where the the, uh, the the 15 kilometer with convection way too little, but the three kilometer was much better. Three kilometer globally was much better. Okay, now here's a really interesting uh, uh, presentation. This shows you the probability density versus rain rate. Okay, and black is observations. Keep that in mind. Black is observed, and you can see it right the spectrum right over here. Okay. Now, M15, 15 kilometer with cumulus parameterization, wow. It's uh, really underplaying the heavy precipitation and overplaying the light. You could see that there. But look at the three kilometer. There's the three kilometer global. It's pretty good, okay, really good. I mean, I, I didn't think it was real when I saw this at first. And, and then the M channel is almost as good, three kilometers in the tropics. And, and having no cumulus parameterization at 15 kilometers, well, that caused some problems like overdoing it and heavy precipitation. So three kilometer global was much, was much better, okay? I said that. Di <clears throat> excuse me, the diurnal variation. This is important. And we separated the ocean from the land, okay? You can see the, the time over here, you know, local time over here, okay? There's a local hour, there's noon over there. Black is observation, okay, it's black, and ocean land. But I want you to look at here at uh, the, 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 the 15 kilometer with cumulus parameterization, phasing was definitely off, definitely off. And, and uh, so that's clear. The three kilometer was way better over the ocean. Over land, it's not quite as dramatic, but the observation shows showed by the black over here, uh, the 15 kilometer acute with cumulus, so the phasing was way off. Um, the three kilometer was definitely better. You see it shifting more to be in phase with the observations over here. Okay. Because strangely enough, the, uh, the 15 kilometer no cumulus parameterization was even better. Okay. Another thing to look at is precipitable water in the tropics, okay? And, and this shows a probability density. This is on the tropical points. This is the ERA-5 reanalysis. And you, know, you can see the mean for the various runs over here. And so here's the observations in black. You know, the three is the three kilometer there. Uh, the no cumulus of the 15 was much, much, much worse. Much, much, much worse. Um, so actually the three kilometer, the, uh, interestingly enough, uh, this is at least this is one area where the 15 uh, kilometer with parameterization was actually a little bit a little bit better. Okay, what about the MJO? Okay, that's propagation characteristics. If you we're looking at Hovmill diagrams here, his longitude here, time in this axis, and I have four different cases here: one, two, three, four. Um, basically, you can see in the observations, the eastward propagation that uh, that occurred in, in a number of these cases here. You can see it right, we're indicating by the oval. Um, if you look at the 15 kilometer with parameterized convection, um, it was not, it wasn't pretty. I mean, this is, this is, this is the bad, okay? M50, the, the propagation just wasn't there. But if you look at the three kilometer global, it was capturing, capturing the propagation, or at least you know, a good part of it in, in, in a number of these cases over here. 
And uh, inter intermediate was the 15 with no cumulus parameterization. So cumulus parameterization really worked against getting the propagation of the MJO correct. And running three kilometer over the globe was definitely better, okay? Okay, so that's, I said that already. Uh, here's another interesting way of looking at the MJO. Okay, I think you can all see where you are. There's Australia, there's, there's India. And we can track how the MGO moves over time. And by the way, here's, you know, here's uh, his observations over here. You can see the thing. But now let's compare uh, truth with the MPAS run at 15 kilometers with the cumulus parameterization and MPAS at three kilometers globally, convective permitting. And let's see how things propagate. Here we go. And I want you to watch this. Oh, so I'm sorry. There we go. It should work now. And you can see that the three kilometer, it ain't perfect, but it's, it is moving in the right direction. Well, when you had the 15 kilometers with the cumulus conversation, it wasn't doing it at all. So superior MJO propagation clearly with three kilometers globally. Um, another thing to look at is we can look at a cross section, a, a, a basically a, a, a cross section, a zonal cross section across the Kelvin wave. And this is pressure in this axis here. And you can think of this as you know, east, east and west of the uh, structure. This is like a vertical cross section through it. This is Q1 you know, showing the, the heating. We also have omega over here. This is ERA5, this is the observations. This is M15, again, 15 kilometers with cumulus parameterization. And this is three kilometers, no cumulus parameterization. And you can see it's the, the three kilometer, you know, this is a, looking at the structure cut through this Kelvin wave at, at, at this, and it's just much, much better structure for the, uh, uh, for the three kilometer. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time, but the, but the omega was much better as well. Um, we could look at divergence structure. Again, this time, this, this, spa this spatial cross section through it. And the structure of divergence and U are much, much better for three the three kilometer than the 15 kilometer with, with uh, parameterization. Now, a question you may ask is, does this give us more predictive skill? Which is a good question. And so we did look at this question. And to give you an idea, uh, this is the four cases, okay? And I'm, we're looking now at, at week three, okay? 500, millib uh, 500 millibar anomalies from, from climatology. And this is, the, this is the observations here, okay? Case one, you can, see, you can see this positive anomaly, the red positive, positive, and negative. And you can see from the various runs, this is for the whole week, okay? Now, what, what I want you to see he also is the correlation coefficient between the observation and the model run, okay, for the various here. And if you look at each one of these, and this, what you'll see is that for case one and week three, the highest anomaly correlation was with the three kilometer global. Case two, it wasn't, but case three, it was, and case four, it was. So three out of the four cases, the three kilometer global was the superior run. Um, you can see that the same thing in this kind of format, it's kind of interesting. Week one, week two, week three, week four, four cases over here. And you can see the, uh, th this is the, the weekly and a uh, height anomaly correlation, so 500 hectopascals. You can see the various runs and the green is the three kilometer global and the blue is the 15 kilometer with parameterization. First week, everybody's pretty good. Right. But as you get to week three, you can see the differences. And, and the, the dashed lines show you the average over all four runs. And the green dashed, which is the three kilometer, is the best. But it was the best in week case one week and, and case three and four, but it wasn't for case two. So one of the four cases, it was not the best. Okay. What about skill at the surface? Well, that's what we care about, right? Um, so I'm going to show you just pressure over here, and this is this is over the whole the whole period. This shows you the mean absolute error for sea level pressure for the various runs over the United States. Okay, and you can if you look carefully, you can see the errors are small for the yellows, 
then the little greens, and then the darker greens and blues, etc. And so this shows you the errors um, for the 15 kilometer with parameterization. Compare that against the three kilometer, much larger errors. And the, and the errors tend to be uh, largest along the coast, I would say here. But definitely the three kilometer global gave a superior forecast compared to the 15 kilometer over the whole globe or using no cumulus parameterization anywhere, or even the channel. The channel didn't do as well, interestingly enough. And you know, I could, I could, I could show you the differences, but you get the idea. The difference between the three-kilometer global and fifteen-kilometer global parameterization. The biggest differences are along the coast here, but it's always the three kilometers better. Um, an another way to look at this is to look at time. This is week one, week two, week three for wind speed, uh, precipitation, mean sea level pressure and temperature, mean absolute error. You can see how the errors change in time for the various, uh, you know, for the various weeks, you know, for, for, the, for, for the, the various uh, various runs. And what I want you to see is that, you know, the three, the three kilometer, which is the green, is often the best one. And I would say the differences are, you know, are clearly the greatest, I think, in week three, with week four being uh, right behind. So we are definitely, we definitely seem to be increasing skill at week three compared to the, uh, the other approaches where we didn't, didn't run three kilometers globally. Okay, so let me summarize over here. And uh, I'm going to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I would say overall, it's clear that the good was the best, both in getting the fidelity of Kelvin waves and, get, and predictability, everything else, the global three kilometer with no convective parameterization. Um, clearly the bad, the worst was 15 kilometer global with parameterization and the ugly, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad, uh, 15 kilometer with no parameterization, strangely enough, and using the tropical three kilometer channel and using the scale of physics. So, so some takeaways here. Uh, it appears from our run, and you know, we, we have a lot more to do, that global convective uh, permitting modeling has become a viable tool for research, and it appears from numerical weather prediction as well. Um, CPM has produced more realistic simulation of large-scale tropical phenomena like Kelvin waves, and the convective processes look much better. I mean, I have a lot of diagnostics I'm not showing you that Nick has, has created. Um, the MJO and 500 millibar verification results are consistent with improved simulation of tropical convection. And we need more cases. Uh, we, quite frankly, we ran out of computer time, but more cases are needed of this. Um, I wanna thank you for listening. And one thing I wanna make clear. I want to thank Bill Skamarok and, and Michael Duda for, for help, helping Nick get started on this. And, and they, they provided a tremendous amount of help. And with that, I will, I will end. All right. Thank you very much, Cliff. Um, so we're running a bit late. So let's, uh, we'll pass on any questions for now and go on to our, our last talk of this session or of the half session, um, modulation of atmospheric rivers by mesoscale frontal waves and latent heating, comparison of two US West Coast events. Um, Allison, are you there? Yes. Thanks, Great. Ryan, can can you guys. Screen. Yep, we see we that see okay? It. it looks good. Perfect. All right. Thanks to guys and thanks for having me. Um, as Brian said, I'm Allison Michaelis and I'll be talking to you today about atmospheric rivers, frontal waves, and latent heating. So just to make sure that we are all on the same page, a little bit of background first. So for this project, we were interested mainly in looking into a particular aspect of atmospheric rivers, which is how frontal waves form and then it go on to affect the event evolution. Mesoscale frontal waves are small scale wave features that by definition form along bare clinic zones, uh, typically associated with mature extropical cyclones. So this schematic from Parker 1998 shows the parent cyclone here and its associated fronts. This kink along the cold front to the southwest is indicative of a cold frontal wave. And then similarly, this kink along the warm front indicates a warm frontal wave. And so oftentimes, although not always, uh, frontal waves can intensify and go on to develop into secondary cyclones. 
The presence of a mesoscale frontal wave can have a direct effect on landfalling precipitation associated with an AR uh, by increasing the duration and or intensity of AR conditions. Um, additionally, the formation of a frontal wave can shift the location of the AR core or create a new branch of the AR altogether, which can make things really difficult from a forecasting perspective. Uh, so for example, uh, here are just a couple snapshots from the Valentine's Day AR event from 2019 that impacted much of California. In the gray contours, we have sea level pressure and the color shading as IVT or integrated vapor transport. And basically what we see with this event is that over this 24 hour period from 0Z on February 12th to 0Z on February 13th, we go from what looks like a pretty straightforward AR situ uh, situation to a frontal wave forming and shifting that orientation of the primary IVT plume to the south and then creating a whole new branch of IVT altogether to the north during cyclogenesis that went on to make landfall in Northern California. So many studies, especially in the European community have looked at frontal waves and secondary cyclogenesis in the North Atlantic, but the relationship and feedbacks between frontal waves and ARs hasn't been explored as much. So to that end, we wanted to build on previous work and uh, act to better quantify the impact that frontal waves and diabetic processes have on ARs and associated landfalling precipitation. So here we chose to simulate two AR events that made landfall in Northern California and that were associated with different mesoscale frontal wave environments. So we went through a, several different cases uh, and settled on two. We settled on a case from mid-December 2014 that Martin et al. 2019 classified as a frontal wave with significant upper air support, and then a case from uh, late January 2010 that was primarily diabetically driven. And we conducted these simulations, we conducted these cases with and without the effects of latent heating to effectively diminish that frontal wave and therefore weaken the AR and mesoscale frontal wave interaction in each case. So for our cases, we used MPASS version 7.0. Um, we used the 10 to 60 kilometer variable resolution mesh with that 10 kilometer area centered just north of Hawaii and expanding out to 60 kilometers elsewhere. For physics, we initially did a four member mini ensemble uh, varying the convective and microphysics parameterizations, but there was a pretty big spread in spatial precipitation patterns between the run. So we chose to only go with the model configuration that best represented the observed precipitation patterns over Northern California in our study area for both cases. So for all runs, we use the, the physics choices that are listed here. We used the RFI of reanalysis for initial conditions and sea surface temperatures that were updated every day. And simulations were initialized uh, 48 hours before the initial formation of the frontal wave. 3D variables are post-processed and interpolated onto pressure levels. And then all variables were interpolated to a 0.1 degree, 0.1 degree lat long grid within the red box shown here. And we did two sets of experiments, like I said, uh, control and dry or no latent heating runs where the latent heating in the microphysics, cumulus, and boundary layer schemes was turned off. So this is similar to the no MP heating nameless flag and wharf, except that we also removed the tendencies from the convective and boundary layer schemes. And a big thanks to Laura Fowler for helping us get this configuration up and running. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna jump right into just comparing the control and no latent heating uh, runs. For the most part, uh, you can trust me or see the, see the paper that was just recently accepted in monthly weather review that the control simulations did do a pretty decent job at replicating both events. So starting with the December 2014 case, um, at initial landfall on 0Z December 10th, so this is about 24 hours into the simulation, AR conditions are occurring along the Washington and Oregon coast and the maximum IVT in the core offshore is within the 1200 to 1400 contour in both instances. The sea level pr pressure trough to the northern, uh, to the north on the northern edge of the AR, and the surface high pressure system to the southeast, though, are slightly weaker in the low latent heating run. So, as I move forward in comparing the AR evolution, I'll also compare the IVT and precipitation impacts over the Russian River Basin, which is indicated by the white star um, in all of the IVT plots. So as I flip through some key times showing sea level pressure and IVT, I'll also ha have these time series up in the bottom um, left and right hand corners for the control and no latent heating runs respectively. These time series show six hourly accumulated mean aerial precipitation over the Russian River watershed in the blue bars, six hourly mean aerial IVT in the black line, and maximum IVT over the watershed in the red asterisks. 
And the vertical dashed lines on the plots indicate the onset and dissipation of AR conditions based on the maximum IV team. So spoiler alert, we can already see that there are some pretty big differences in the timing, the magnitude, and duration of IVT and precipitation, but we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. So as we move forward in time, AR conditions move farther inland and reach the Russian River around 18Z on December 10th with a maximum IVT of around 400 units in both the control and the late heating simulations. And a few hours later, around 48 hours into the simulation at 21 UTC on December 10th, we start to notice some pretty large differences between the two systems. For one, the AR object, which is roughly traced here, is um, pretty considerably larger in the control run. And part of the reason for this is the development of that mesoscale frontal wave in the control run, which tightens that sea level pressure gradient and helps create this new cusp or secondary branch of IVT, which just doesn't happen at all in the no lady heating simulation. There's no indication of a frontal wave uh, with no sea level pressure depression or secondary IVT maximum along that poleward side of the AR tail. And just to dig a little bit deeper into why the frontal wave didn't form in the no lady heating simulation, uh, we looked at both upper level and lower level dynamics in the 12 hours or so leading development. For the upper levels, in terms of at least 500 hectopascal heights and 250 winds, there really weren't dramatic differences between the two experiments. Uh, the lower levels were really instead where we saw the, the most noticeable differences. So here is the 850 uh, hectopascal specific humidity in the shading, potential temperature in the gray contours, wind barbs, and vorticity in the purple contours for 6, 12, and 18Z on December 10th. So again, those those times leading up to frontal wave development at 21Z. And I wanna draw your attention mainly to these black boxes here in the top row. Um, at each of these times, there are these little low level cyclonic vorticity maxima associated with enhanced lower tropospheric moisture that are evident along the front and the backside of the AR and the control run. But they just aren't there at all in the no lane heating run. So we think this really comes down to the positive feedbacks between that enhanced moisture convergence and cyclonic circulation that allows that circulation to strengthen and penetrate to the surface and create that frontal wave. Without those things, without the sufficient moisture and moisture convergence and related diabetic feedbacks and the no latent heating run, we just, we don't see that. The frontal wave just can't develop. So getting back to the AR itself, um, AR conditions continue to propagate eastward through 6Z on December 11th in both simulations, um, penetrating farther inland over Northern California while beginning to dissipate over Washington and Oregon. Interestingly, the IVT over the Russian peaks at this time in the late heating run with a maximum IVT around 850, whereas the maximum IVT over the watershed in the control run is right around 640. So this is in part due to that intensification of the frontal wave and the control run, uh, which helps to intensify the AR offshore and slow its propagation towards the coast. This is also right around the same time that Martin et al. 2019 showed a hiatus in AR conditions at the Bodega Bay ARO due to the AR stalling offshore, which matches the stimulated lull in AR conditions in the control run. So therefore, as a result, the IBT in the control run doesn't peak over the watershed until six hours later at 12 UTC, and does so at a much higher level, uh, reaching a maximum of 1,025 kilogram per meter per second. In the no latent heating run, on the other hand, air conditions are starting to dissipate over the watershed and completely dissipate over the region by zero Z on the 12th. In the control run though, air conditions do hold out. They last a little while longer. Uh, exiting the watershed by 6C on the 12th. So if we take a step back again and zoom back out and sort of look at this whole time series of IBT and precipitation over the Russian River watershed, we see that because of the weaker and shorter duration AR and the no latent heating simulation, precipitation totals are reduced quite considerably from about 5.8 inches to, in the control run to just over two inches in the no latent heating run. So an AR still happens in the dry run, it still rains a decent amount over the watershed, but the timing, uh, the intensity, and the duration of the event are all impacted by the lack of diabetic processes and consequently a lack of frontal wave and secondary cyclone formation. All right, so let's move on now to the January case. Uh, we'll also start by comparing the two runs at the time of initial landfall. Uh, here is 12Z on January 24th. So the format for this slide sequence will be the same as before. We have the control simulation on the left, the no latent heating simulation on the right, 
focusing mainly on sea level pressure and IVT. And in the later slides, we'll have those same precip IVT time series in the bottom corners. So at the time of initial landfall here, uh, the landfall, the AR and the uh, no latent heating simulation is slightly farther offshore, but the AR is still starting to make landfall in the same general area in the Pacific Northwest in both cases. Uh, the cyclone to the Northwest is of similar strength in both instances, and the IVT magnitude is comparable with the maximum IVT in the core between 800 and 1,000 units in both runs. AR conditions reached the Russian River watershed around 0Z on the 25th in both the control and no latent heating simulations. And while the IVT right along the coastline isn't too different between the two, uh, so the maximum IVT, for example, um, over the Russian is uh, between 280 and 285 in both cases, we do start to notice some pretty large differences offshore. Um, so for one, the extropical cyclone and associated IVT around it uh, is, is weaker in the no latent heating stimulation. Secondly, the maximum IVT within the core of the AR making landfall is less intense, uh, showing a maximum IVT about 100 units weaker. And last, which will be more important in the next time step, um, the low pressure system in the Central Pacific around 155 or so west uh, is more developed in the control run, and that creates a more organized IVT maximum in the area. 12 hours later, 12Z on January 25th, the initial AR has basically dissipated over, over that Northern California region, over the Russian River watershed, and just leaving a small IVT plume offshore in both cases. And the most obvious different he, difference here is that lack of a uh, frontal wave and the no latent heating run, which isn't surprising since we chose this case based on its pretty substantial diabetic influence. And similar to the December case, although I don't have the plots here, uh, the most substantial differences between the experiments and the times leading up to frontal wave development were again in the lower troposphere with that enhanced moisture and vorticity and deformation along the frontal zone upstream of the frontal wave in the control run and lack thereof really in the, in the no latent heating simulation. What's interesting though, is that as a result of, of these feedbacks, not only is the AR core weaker in the no latent heating run, um, but there is also just one continuous IVT plume rather than two separate ones. So it appears that the frontal wave and extropical cyclone to the west in the control simulation, along with their feedbacks on the IVT field, help create these two distinct ARs in the control run, uh, which just, again, doesn't happen in the, the no latent heating simulation. So in the control run, uh, the AR closest to California moves inland and creates that second stronger wave of AR conditions over the Russian. In the no latent heating run, the AR does continue to propagate eastward toward, towards Northern California, but without that frontal wave, AR conditions just barely reach the coast and penetrate inland. So while there is technically a second pulse of elevated IVT in the no latent heating run between 6 and 12Z on the 26th, the maximum IVT clocks in at a, a measly 225 kilogram meter per second. And for reference, uh, we've been using uh, an IVT threshold of 250 to be considered AR conditions. So in the control run, AR conditions uh, hold out a little while longer and completely dissipate over the region by about 12Z on the 26th. So again, to summarize the January 2010 results, we can kind of take a step back and look at this whole time series uh, for the Russian River watershed. And the key differences here are that while there were still two peaks in IVT, in the no latent heating run, uh, the second peak is weaker than the first and likely due just to the e usual eastward propagation of the system. So while we can't conclude that the frontal wave was, was, was a sole cause of the second AR pulse over the Russian, uh, we can say that with the frontal wave present, air conditions during the second wave began, began 12 hours earlier, uh, contributed to 18 additional hours of AR conditions over the watershed. And as a consequence, Precipitation totals were about double in the control run. They're about 2.8 inches in the control versus 1.4 in the no latent heating run. You have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, so there's obviously a lot to unpack in these simulations and uh, turning off latent heat everywhere does more than just affect frontal waves and ARs. Uh, but these results do give us a good idea and at least a good first guess of how important these processes are to frontal wave development and the frontal wave AR interaction. So we looked at two different cases here with pretty different cyclogenesis mechanisms and concluded fairly similar results that diabetic processes do have a large impact on the formation of frontal wave features 
and consequently on the associated ARs and related impacts. Um, so we only looked at these two, two cases so far in this framework, uh, so it'd be really useful to put these results into context with a larger sample of cases. And that's all I have, so if there's time, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Allison. Um, it's a nice study. Uh, does, are there any questions? Please raise your hand or pull something in the uh, Slido chat. Yes, Jimmy. Yeah. I also had a question, one question in Slido. But um, when you do the no latent heating run, you turn mm -hmm. off the um, PBL flux, uh, heat. Does that mean you also don't have sensible heat flux because the PBL tendency includes a sensible heat flux? Mm. Right, that's a good question. So I did pull up the, the changes that we made um, at, and at the advice of, of Laura. And so we just turn off that theta tendency and set that to zero. Okay, so it really is a no diabetic heating run then, I think, it, because it, it may turn off the sensible heat flux too then. Okay. That, that's, so, yeah, that's good. To so if you, yeah, if you want to be an interesting test to just turn off the latent heating by itself, which would be excluding the PBL, uh, keeping the PBL tendency. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, we have a question from Cliff Mass. What are the implications for AR predictability of your work? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Cliff. I think kind of what we're what we're getting at and what this study shows is that the diabetic processes are just so important to getting uh, the AR correct. So if our forecast models aren't resolving those processes, if they're not getting them right, then our forecasts are not gonna be perfect. They'll be good in kind of the general sense, but getting that precipitation forecast and getting um, the forecast of these smaller scale uh, features like frontal waves will suffer as a result. All right. Um, I believe the other questions might be uh, one of them at least is directed to Cliff Mass. Any other questions for Alice? Going once, going twice. All right. Thank you very much, uh, yeah, Alice. Thank you. Um, so we're going to be taking a 20 minute break. And so we will be starting back at uh, 1042. Uh, Brian? Yes. Sorry. Uh, let's bring, where is Brian? Let's bring up those questions for Cliff. Uh, for those who would like to stay and uh, talk to Cliff, uh, yeah, let's uh, see if we can get some of the questions for Cliff's talk. Yeah. All right, uh, Cliff, if you're available. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly available. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let's start with the second one. Have you done a Grill Fritas on the 15 kilometer only run? Curious to see if the, some issues were occurring to the transition zone. I think the, yeah, I think the answer is yes, but I wish, uh, and, and if Nick was here, he can talk about that. But I think the, I think the answer is, is, is yes. And I, and I don't think that that, you know, I, I think the results are still there. Okay. Um, interesting to see the effect of scale aware scheme when applied on a contiguous domain. Mm -hmm. the same person. Um, Jimmy, you had a question for Cliff as well? Yeah, uh, yeah, I did. Um, you showed the biases or the, yeah, the, the for the uh, surface pressure, that was interesting. You showed the surface pressure verification biases, and somehow the three kilometer was removing or improving the surface pressure, especially in the Pacific Northwest. Do you know is that related to the depth of the cyclones, or is it a positional error? What was it correcting when you did the three kilometer for those systems? Right, it was. It, I mean, it was changing the synoptics, obviously, but. Uh... Yeah, other than, other than, I mean, I can't give you anything explicit right now, but it, but it, it was changing the wave trains coming into, into, into North America. And so, that, so, that, so that was definitely having that impact. So, yeah, so it's a timing, it may be a timing as opposed to bias issue, or it could be that the, the, the pressure is lower as well. Right, so, so, they, so they, those questions of phasing versus amplitude, and uh, I can't answer that right now. I, I, don't, I don't know if Nick tore that apart. 
Um, but do you have a, yeah, do you have a feeling from what would be going over the tropical channel that it doesn't improve much? Yeah, I, it just appears that the scale aware physics is not perfect and that it did have implications. It did change things within the channel itself. So, uh, so I, I think that's the answer to it. You know, it, it didn't, it did have influence in, it, it did have, it, there was not, it was not non-zero influence inside the channel. Okay. Um, again, we're taking questions during the uh, break period. We'll start again at uh, 40 minutes after. Uh, Sergio is asking, what is the idea of using 15 kilometers with no parameterization? Well, in, there's been a number of, papers suggesting that you know you could get away with no parameterizations at course of resolution and uh, and that's better than that it's better than you'd think and in some some ways we've confirmed that there's some aspects of that were actually quite positive but in general it was negative and overall you know that that produced a, a worse simulation certainly a worse simulation than than the three kilometer uh, over the globe so, I mean, that's clearly the gold standard here, if you can afford it. Right. Uh, what was the resolution of the ERA-5 and trim data that was used? I don't know that. I can't, I, I, I can't, I can't tell you. If the, uh, I think the ERA, I think, is on the order of, you know, tens of kilometer scale. But uh, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I'd have to get back to you e back to about that. ERA is a 38 kilometer, roughly. Yeah. Yeah, this something like that. Yes, yeah, yeah, 30, yeah. 35, 38. Uh, trim, I just searched. It says it's quarter degree, but uh, yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, th this is why it'd be good to have Nick here. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, their second question was, can we summarize that even simulations at micro scale, parentheses three kilometers, may simulate synoptic phenomena well? Just kind of... No, what you mean? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, it's having implications for synoptic phenomena, right? Because you're by right. by changing the convection, you're changing the the weight, the, the the larger scale wave pattern that is affecting synoptics. So that's it's definitely doing that. Could we use this in prediction of tropical cyclones? Well, I mean, there's no reason you couldn't. I mean, clearly, you'd expect three kilometers to do better than 15 kilometers for parameterization of a tropical cyclone. So, so uh, yeah, so the answer is certainly yes. All right, uh, Cliff, many questions for you. If you're good, we're taking a few more. Can you explain why the phase of the diurnal, diurnal cycle was better by the M15 no Q simulations? Uh, I can't, but obviously it's, it's affecting convective dynamics and the coupling to the surface. And that is that's that and that and that's changing the phasing. So uh, I, I can't give you an, an answer to that. Uh, Nick might be able to, uh, and 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 contact him. I, he might be able to help you there. Can, can I comment? Uh, this is way here. Sure. I, I think it is reported that uh, convective parameterization usually, usually, uh, uh, not every one of them, but uh, a lot of uh, the uh, convective parameterization have a timing issue. Overland, mm -hmm. uh, they tend to start the convection too early. And that probably explains why when you turn the convective parameterization mm -hmm. off, uh, they improves the uh, timing of uh, uh, convection of uh, rainfall, in this case, overland. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, we have a hand raised by Dave Stouffer. Dave, do you want to go ahead and ask? Dave, are you there? Oh, we, we see you, but I don't think we hear you. You're still muted. There we go. Yeah, I got it. Uh, I guess it's not so surprising that the higher resolution, uh, uniform resolution run did best. Uh, has any, anyone found that there's any advantage aside from saving computer time to use the variable resolution across the globe? I mean, should we be surprised by that result? I guess I'm not. No, I don't think you should. I mean, the question, I mean, I mean, the, our question was, was, could, could you, you know, get away with just doing the channel and save substantial amount of time? Right. right. I mean, I mean, obviously that's why we, we, we were, we were trying, but if you can, it, it makes a lot of sense to run three kilometers globally because, and then you have other teleconnections between convection in the Midwest, United States and Europe, et cetera. Right. So you want to do three kilometer globally if you can. 
Right. Agreed. Okay, a few more questions. Uh, thanks for the presentation. How are the three kilometer precip results affected by tropical cyclones? I don't know if that's something you considered. Uh, yeah, I, I can't answer that. Um, I mean, it, it, it did change the some of the frequency of tropical cyclones, but I, can, I, I, I can't give you that number, sorry. And one last question here, any interest in tilted pixel solar at near slash subclometer? That's actually not for you. I think that was for our yeah. speaker on, uh, on solar, Pedro. Uh, Pedro, if you're there, can you address this question? Yeah, I, I'm here. So we are certainly open for collaboration and improving the world solar model. And this particular one, I, I don't understand it well, the question. So I'll suggest that uh, you send me an, an email and I can provide more feedback. Um, okay. I, I, I understood the question uh, because I think it was asked uh, yesterday. Um, it's um, related to whether you want to allow for the different, the clouds, the, the sun being tilted at its tilted angle. So the shadow isn't directly underneath the clouds at high resolution. Right, so, so um, and we've thought about that and uh, not in the solar project, but elsewhere. And, um, but it, the solar project may be one place, but you really do need high resolution for the shadow position to matter and also to be very confident where your clouds are. So it's not clear how much benefit you get from that, um, but, but it has been thought about. your hand is up. Did you have another comment? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I just want to caution that uh, uh, Cliff's uh, results uh, in general for NPAS simulation, Wolf model probably as well, uh, that is pertaining to a certain set of physics. If you change physics, probably the cumulus primization especially, and you could get somewhat quite different uh, results. Just a caution there. Uh, for... Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's fair, fair enough. I mean, all, I mean, all we're saying is that you know, this is a pretty productive area to explore if, if you have the computer resources. That, that's basically what we're saying. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the uh, the break officially ends in eight minutes. I'm at ten forty Mountain Time. So the uh, uh, please. Uh, return or stay tuned for four more talks uh, starting in eight minutes. Thank you, Brian. So where you want me to start on time? Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> or, take a break for now. Uh, yeah. it, it, are, are all the speakers there for the, for the next session? We'll check. Yes. Okay, you let me know. Okay, thank okay. you. Uh, let's see who's the first going. On? I'm here. I'm the first. Okay. And oh, Andreas Joe? is there. Good. Yes. Okay. Joe, are you the chair? I'm Great. the chair. Great. Joe, Joe. I'm here. Good. Mike, I think I see him somewhere. Yep, I am here. Okay. And the Bill. I'm here. Good. So you're set, Cliff. All, Excellent. All of them are here. Yeah. Perfect, we have a great session, thank you.
Andreas, are you there? I'm here. Yeah, you can bring up your slide now. Okay. Okay, we start in one minute. Yeah, we'll let him bring up the slide. Can you see that? Yes. Perfect. Yes. It's very clear. Very dramatic picture. Oh yeah, this is what I was going for. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> that's a that's a beautiful picture. It's not mine, unfortunately. Okay. But should we begin, Way? You there, Way? No. Yeah. <laughs> should, should, yeah. Should I get? Should we get? Should we start the session? Okay. Yes. Let Let's get started. Uh, uh, so that we okay. can finish. Great. Well, welcome to the next session. It's a really good one. And the first talk will be convection permitting wharf climate modeling at continental scales. And Andreas Prain will be giving the presentation. Go, go ahead, Andreas. Thank you, Cliff. Yeah, welcome also from my side. This is really a review of work that we have done at NCAR over the last approximately 10 years, um, mainly led by the NCAR water system program. So I wanted to give you a quick overview of what, what the content will be. Uh, we'll start off with a, basically a review of uh, mentioning what efforts, major efforts we have, uh, modeling efforts we have done over the last 10 years. Then moving on to simulating precipitations. I will mostly focusing on precipitation and convection here, um, simulating the precipitation in the Western US and in the Eastern US, since those, those are very different processes that you have to capture. Um, I, then we move on to South America and look at mesoscale convective systems there, and then I will wrap up with some conclusions. So this gives you an overview of the major modeling efforts that we, we have uh, performed with the Wolf model over the last tech decade or so. We started off with a fairly small domain over the Colorado headwaters. This was really our um, first simulations at, at four kilometers. So all of these simulations actually have four kilometers grid spacing because we found that Four kilometers is, is probably the sweet spot where you can run the model for quite a long time efficiently, but you still get a lot of benefits from capturing processes more accurately. Um, so we started off with the Colorado headwaters. Um, these are reanalysis re driven, fairly small domain, eight years. This was a big success. We, we published a lot of papers, um, got very good results. We're encouraged to move on and uh, got a bigger supercomputer at Anchor and we're able to run the CONUS-1 simulations. Um, those are 13 year long simulations, again, reanalysis driven and um, also four kilometers. I wanted to say we have current climate and future climate simulations for most of those. I will only focus on current climate at this talk because of time constraints. So CONUS-1, we published a lot on CONUS-1 as well. Um, and moved on to CONUS 2, which has a little bit bigger domain. We are collaborating with um, colleagues in Canada and extended the domain quite far up into the north. Um, this is one bigger difference. The simulations are also a little bit longer. They are 20 years long and they are GCM driven. So they are, um, have a very different driving, data, uh, driving forcing data than the CONUS 1, for example. Um, this is currently in progress. The current climate is done. We are working on the future climate at the moment, 20 years in the future. Um, we are also currently working on a data set, which we call CONUS 404. This stands for um, WOLF at four kilometers for 40 years. So this will basically cover the reanalysis or the, the satellite period from 1979 till basically present uh, with four kilometers over the same domain that we had in CONUS 1. So the one that's really focused on the CONUS. And then we also currently work on South America simulations that I will also talk about a little bit in, in the next couple of slides. Um, so this is a very big domain. Um, we'll also be a 20 year run at four kilometers and we will also have a future climate uh, simulation here. Additionally, we have simulations over Hawaii and Alaska that I won't talk about, but I wanted to mention that all of these data sets, we really um, try to make the data openly available. Um, so if you're interested in using any of those data sets, that are already published, please reach out and I can help you to get access to the data. So next I wanted to show you the main physics options that we used. So we really tried to build up on our experience from one simulation to the next. So I, I mentioned this Colorado headwater simulations were the first. Um, 
basically these are the main physics options. We used Wolf version 3.11, um, the NOAA land surface model, Thompson microphysics scheme, YSU, PBL scheme, and the CAM3 radiation scheme. Um, this worked pretty well for Colorado. Then we moved on to the Conus scale with Conus 1 and found that the snowpack was really poorly simulated, especially um, in, the northwest, in the Northwest, uh, because uh, the NOAA, MP, NOAA land surface model has a, only a single layer snow model. And it's really important to have a multi-layer snow model if you want to capture the snowpack in the Pacific Northwest correctly because of, of melting and refreezing that you have to capture. Um, so we, we changed to the NOAA MP model, which has this capability and which improved the snowpack uh, simulation quite a lot. We also used the Thomson aerosol aware microphysics scheme. So we, we had some aerosol, a better aerosol treatment in the schemes, and we changed to the RMT and G um, radiation scheme. Um, next, when we moved to Conus 2, we had quite big biases in the simulations. We weren't able to resolve them. I will talk about those in, the, in a couple of minutes. In the central US, in the summertime mainly, um, this turned out to be related to groundwater issues or land atmosphere interactions, and including groundwater. Um, improved the simulations a lot. So this is basically what we did here. We um, added the groundwater module to NOAA MP, and I will show you how this improved or how this impact the simulations. And we are pretty happy with this setup at the moment. So the CONUS 2 setup is very similar to what we use in the CONUS 4.4. Uh, also the model version is very, very similar. And it's also very similar to what we use in the South America simulation, except that we updated our wolf model version and we have more vertical levels and the higher model top because of the deeper convection in South America. So let's get started with some results, starting with um, simulating the water cycle in the Rockies or simulating precipitation in the Western US. And um, this is really from the very early work that we did over the Colorado headwaters. So this is the Colorado Rockies that you see here. And we, show, we look at the cross section. You can see the vertical wind um, along this cross section during um, a day where we had wind from the south um, southwest and you can see if you use coarse resolution models at 36 kilometers you have a very broad updrafts not very intense and they lead to um, snow accumulations at very wrong spots so if you go to higher resolution at six kilometers or higher you can see you get this very narrow up and down drafts and they really helping you to get the snowpack in the right place um, this is basically um, shown here as well. This is from our CONUS 2 simulations, which is a bigger domain now. We are looking at the difference in snow accumulation. Um, uh, if you divide the four kilometer simulations, or if you subtract the snow from the 12 kilometer simulations from the four kilometer simulations. So basically what you clearly see here is that you underestimate the snow along the coastal mountain ranges and you overestimate the snowpack in the interior. The reason for that is basically exactly what we look over here. The, the mountains are not very well represented in the 12 kilometers. So you don't, you get too few, like too little snow in the mountain ranges and the, the rain shadowing effect is missing here. So you advect too much moisture into the interior of the continent and then you dump too much moisture in, in the continental Rocky Mountains. So this is a very clear signal that we really see from basically the Sierra Nevadas up to Canada and Alaska. Um, and just to show you, this is one result comparing the snow accumulation and precipitation at snow tail sites in the Pacific Northwest. And you can see the model is doing a really good job. This is from the CONUS-1 simulations in, in capturing the annual precipitation accumulation. So black is snow tail accumulation and the red is the wolf model. And this is showing you the snowpack accumulation and melt that the model is simulating. So also this is very, very well simulated. We still underestimate the peak snowpack by approximately 20%. It's very systematic and we are still working on resolving this issue. But overall the, the accumulation and this, uh, the melting of the snowpack is, is very well captured. And you can have a look at this recent paper which um, has much more details over this. Um, so of course, like we can also look at the summertime in the Western US. I bring up this figure here. This is from the Causes Project, which actually focused on biases in the central US, but it also shows you that there are very systematic biases. These are from the CMIP-5 model ensemble. So these are global climate models. They very systematically overestimate precipitation in, in the Western, U, Western United uh, States in the summertime. And this is a very similar bias that we have if we use, for example, WOLF um, at coarser resolution at 36 kilometers, for example, we did these simulations. 
testing various um, physics um, physics schemes here, uh, starting from different cumulus schemes, but also we perturb uh, the microphysics, um, the PBL scheme, the radiation scheme. Uh, those other perturbations are basically the spread here. The main um, main impact on the general cycle of precipitation in the summertime was really coming from the cumulus scheme. So you can see, depending on which cumulus scheme you use in Wolf, you can modify the general cycle quite a bit, but you're always quite far away from where the observations are. So you always overestimate the, uh, the amount of precipitation that you get. Also, the peak timing is too early. I think we talked about this in the previous session as well. And this is basically coming from an overestimation of the frequency of rainfall. So you have very frequent rainfall. So it rains almost every day, but very weak. So the intensity is way too low. The frequency is too high. This is very systematic. So this is not only Wolf, also other models have these issues. If you go to four kilometers, this is not from our CONUS-1 simulations. You can see that you largely improve the, uh, the general cycle of precipitation in this region. So now the amount is much more similar. The peak timing is pretty well captured. The frequency and intensity is, is very well ca um, captured as well. So those, those results agree very well from results in other regions like Europe or Asia, where people found similar things that you improve the general cycle of precipitation quite a lot if you go to kilometer scales. So let's move on to the Eastern United States um, and specifically looking at mesoscale convective systems. So M MCSs are big complexes of thunderstorms. This is a nice example uh, from a geostationary satellite that shows you how um, big the systems can be. They can span multiple states in the United States and they are really dominating this, uh, the, the climate in, in the summer season in the central US. So this is also shown here. We noticed since the 80s that approximately um, 30 to 70% of the summertime precipitation in the central US is coming from MCSs. So simulating those systems realistically is extremely important to capture the summer climate correctly in the central US, but also they are related to major flood events. So they're the, the, the main drivers of flooding in the central US and other regions. So simulating MCSs is really important. The problem is that global climate models um, and also reanalysis models of weather forecasting models, global global models are um, simulating MCSs very poorly. And this results, this is coming back to this causes project, this results in systematic biases, for example, a warm bias and dry bias in the central US. So we know this is also known from several studies. This is just one example that we recently published that if you go to higher resolution grid spacings to convection permitting, where you don't have to use deep convection parameterization schemes, you improve the simulation of MCSs quite dramatically. So you can clearly see this is from idealized wolf simulations. If you use 12 kilometers with or without cumulus scheme, it doesn't matter a lot. Um, you get a very different rainfall pattern than if you use explicit convection and go to kilometer scales and higher. So we ran this down to 250 meters. And you can really see there's a, a step improvement in how these systems look like if you go to four kilometers and don't use the deep convection scheme. So we, we were really hopeful that if we use four kilometers in our simulations, that we will improve the simulation of MCSs in the, in the central United States. So this is what I'm showing you here. Uh, this is from the CONUS-1 simulations. I'm showing you the annual cycle of mesoscale convective systems in the central US month by month. So you can see we already, this is June, July, August, we are in the peak season of MCSs in the central US. Almost every day we have one MCS in this region. Um, and when we, this is coming from observations, radar observations. Um, when we ran CONUS-1, we were really happy until June. So we almost nailed the frequency of MCSs. And then afterwards, the model really went off. And we only had maybe a third of the MCSs that we wanted to have. This resulted in very strong dry and warm biases in the central US. So the climate of the central, it was really poorly simulated. And it took us several years to figure out where these biases are coming from. And it turns out it's the land atmosphere interaction. So if you use wolf at kilometer scales without the groundwater scheme, you get very strong warm biases in the central US. So we had in this simulation, we had up to eight degrees warm bias. So very extreme biases. If you introduce a shallow groundwater scheme, which allows you to have lateral flow of groundwater, you improve these biases dramatically. So you, you remove all these biases close to zero. And we rerun this simulation now with this CONUS 404 simulations, including groundwater. And you can see how well we simulate um, the MCSs now also in the late season. So there's a big improvement here. Um, 
which is mainly due to the land atmosphere coupling. Uh, you can also do the same thing if you use, these are reanalysis driven, if you use um, a GCM driven run, this is from like CONUS 2 is driven with the CSM climate model. And you can see also here the red line is showing you the four kilometer simulations that we have. We, we are simulating the annual Cyclop MCS is pretty well in the simulations as well. However, only at four kilometers, we have a 12 kilometer counterpart and you can see even if you use groundwater, you're not able to capture the MCS frequency correctly. So you have big improvements if you use four kilometers in the central US, but you really have to get the land atmosphere coupling right. This is the basic message here. Five so, minutes. Thank you. Uh, just to show you, this is a, a radar loop, how the simulations look like. Uh, I wanted you to guess which one is the simulation, which one is the satellite image quickly. Um, so they, they do a really good job in, in capturing cloud cover and also precipitation. This is from the CONUS 44 simulation. So the left one is the CONUS, is, is the Wolf model. The right one is the GEOS 14 uh, observation. So the few, last few minutes, I wanted to show you some South America simulations that we're working on. This is done within the South America Affinity Group. It's a, a consortium of a lot of uh, member institutes that are participating. I have some of them down here. You can click on this website and get, get more information about it. So it's a fairly big domain. Again, four kilometer wolf simulation. Um, I just wanted to highlight this um, one case, one big MCS case that we simulated pretty well. This is from the observations where you can see the MCS started down here. It, it lasted for several days and moved to the Northeast. And we simulate this, this um, case very well, but also other kinds of convection are pretty well simulated. So what we did here, we tracked the MCSs and compared tracked MCSs versus uh, in the observations in the model. And this is what you can see here. So the model, you can see it does a pretty good job in capturing approximately the location and the, the tracks of the more intense MCSs. So for example, the one that we just looked at was this one here in the model and the model track and the observed track lie on top of each other really nicely. This is showing you um, the amount of precipitation that comes from MCSs compared to the total precipitation over the year. This is from observations and this from the Wolf model run that we have. You can see that the Wolf model is doing a pretty good job. Up to 80% of the precipitation in Argentina is coming from MCSs. And this agrees very well with uh, observations. And also the Amazon is, is simulated very well here, almost better than the iMERGE product. And the last slide that I had, um, this is showing you the annual cycle of MCS frequency in the Amazon basis and, and the La Plata basin. And again, you can see that the, the model is doing a really good job in capturing the annual cycle of MCSs. So concluding, um, kilometer scale models can give you a lot of benefits if you run them on climate time scales. Um, they improve the down cycle, the phase and intensity of precipitation quite a lot. You give you much better simulation of the snowpack. Um, they simulate the convective general cycle much better and the frequency and intensity of MCS is, is extremely well captured. It's really important to capture the, the land atmosphere processes interactions correctly in these simulations. This is one lesson that we learned. And what's encouraging is that the same model physics seems to work pretty well in North and South America. So again, we, we did this intentionally to test if we can use the same model physics in different climate zones. Uh, with the goal to go to, uh, to global convection meeting models. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Andreas. That's a really excellent talk. But you know, one, one general question, why did the groundwater scheme have such a large impact on the MCSs in the second half of the summer? It's almost, that's kind of surprising maybe, but maybe not. No, it's what's surprising to us as well. The reason is if you go to four kilometers, you get shallow river valleys resolved in the central US. And then you get lateral groundwater flow into this, these valleys and you increase the latent heating um, quite a bit in those areas. So you get what may wo mo way more evaporation because your, your ground groundwater table is way sh more shallow. And nice. this is really important in the second half. The first half is main, mainly large large scale forced MCSs, but the second half is a lot of local scale interactions. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm looking at if there's any questions here. I don't see any at this point. And any, any, anybody have any questions? Give it, give it a few seconds to see if it populates. Okay, well, if not, let's, uh, let's keep on going. Thank you very much. Thanks, Cliff. Sure. Okay. Let's move on to the next talk. 
And that's going to be design and configuration of MPAS for deep atmosphere numerical weather prediction and geospace applications. And Joe Klemp will be giving the presentation. Uh, go, go ahead, Joe. Okay, good morning. Um, can you see my slides okay? Yes, we can see them. Okay. Well, <clears throat> yeah, Bill Stamrock mentioned yesterday that we, uh, one of the things we're working on with MPAS is uh, extending its its capability to uh, uh, be applicable for uh, large atmospheric depths, uh, both for numerical weather prediction and uh, going further uh, for geospace applications where we might have a, a single non-hydrostatic model that can span the, uh, the entire uh, atmosphere. As we look to increase the, uh, the, the depth of the, of the model domain, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, interesting challenges that arise. Uh, of course, uh, in our numerical weather prediction business, we're mostly uh, simulating uh, down in the uh, troposphere, stratosphere, uh, uh, where we have uh, con constant atmospheric uh, constituents and so on. However, if we go higher, uh, as you move into the mesosphere, which starts at about 50 kilometers, goes up to around 90, uh, the temperature starts decreasing again. Uh, but then above this level, it starts increasing rapidly and it can reach some very high values. Uh, this region is called the thermosphere. And it basically extends up to about the level where the continuum equations cease to be valid. In other words, where, where the mean free path of a molecule is starting to get uh, of the same uh, scale as the density scale height. Uh, to give you a feeling, uh, the, uh, the International Space Station has its average altitude here at about 400 kilometers. So uh, the the top of the thermosphere is, is way up there. Uh, there's a, a dramatic change in the atmospheric conditions as we go through that depth. For example, uh, pressure drops from uh, 1,000 millibars down to 10 to the minus eight uh, up here. Uh, density drops by about 12 orders of magnitude, uh, going up to about 500 kilometers. Another interesting feature is, is that molecular viscosity and thermal conductivity, which is uh, clearly negligible uh, in the troposphere and stratosphere, uh, increases uh, by uh, 12 orders of magnitude, the molecular diffusivity. And that's because it's being divided by density, which is dropping by that amount. And so in the uh, middle upper thermosphere, these uh, molecular uh, diffusion terms actually uh, start to dominate. So as we look to uh, modify the model to accommodate these conditions, uh, as we make the model top higher, we now have to uh, start to uh, account for the actual geocentric distance uh, from the center of the Earth as opposed to uh, just assuming that the atmosphere layer is small, small enough that we can just use the Earth radius uh, in the governing equations. This has a significant effect on the grid mesh configuration because now the, uh, the cross-sectional area of the grid cells are increasing with height. And of course, this means that uh, gravity now will be decreasing uh, with height that we need to take account of. And also we need to use the full Coriolis terms, uh, including those involving vertical velocity components. Now, these three changes are ones that allow uh, us to remove the shallow atmosphere approximation from the equations. So when people talk about deep atmosphere equations, they're often talking about uh, making these three generalizations uh, to the shallow atmosphere system. Uh, and these changes uh, have now been implemented in the full 3D MPAS model uh, and are uh, uh, seem to be working well. 
when you start to go above uh, somewhere around uh, order 100, 150 kilometers, now uh, things get more complicated. Uh, one factor is, is that we now need to uh, account for variable atmospheric composition uh, it, and its coupling to the model dynamics. Uh, as a result of this, we end up, we also have to modify our thermodynamic equation to account for this variable composition. Uh, I mentioned the large uh, viscosity and diffusivity terms. We need to uh, uh, include those. And of course, in, in a full model, uh, there's a lot of other uh, physics and chemistry that's needed for things like uh, uh, solar and dual heating, ion drag, oxygen dissociation, and so on. Uh, right now, we're just looking at the changes to the dynamical equation. So we're not uh, uh, considering yet adding any of these physics. And in testing these additional modifications, we're working just in a, uh, a two-dimensional uh, slab model version of MPAS for simplicity. I mentioned the fact that we need to take into account the uh, geometry of the grid cells. Uh, in a shallow atmosphere model, our horizontal grid sizes like dx, for example, are constant with height. But now with a deeper atmosphere, we see that those uh, dimensions are increasing with height. Uh, so we, we need to account for that. Uh, in our uh, flux form representation in the equations, uh, we use a, a, a density with this squiggle over it uh, it's divided by d zeta dz, which maps the, uh, the, the vertical transformation uh, increments into actual z's, so that this row squiggle is proportional actually to the mass now in, in the volume. Because of the varying cross-sectional area of the grid volumes for a deep atmosphere, we need to modify that. So if this row squiggle is going to uh, represent the uh, the mass in the volume. We also have to scale it with the uh, with the with the area, and we similarly do that with our uh, flux variables uh, that represent the uh, uh, the fluxes of mass uh, across the boundaries of of the grid cell. If we do that, then our uh, transport equations. For example, this is showing the uh, uh, the continuity equation actually maintain the same form that they had for the shallow atmosphere, having redefined this row squiggle and and the uh, and the use, so that they have the same form as as they did originally. So that makes it uh, uh, a fairly simple and straightforward thing to accommodate these variable grid sizes in the in the model numerics. Uh, I mentioned the variable composition in our uh, numerical weather prediction models and so on. We assume that that's constant and that we have around 80% nitrogen and 20% uh, oxygen. But as we go to higher levels, uh, that begins to uh, change dramatically. Um, the reason is, is because the molecular uh, constituents uh, have different molecular weights. And because of their different molecular weights, they basically want to redistribute themselves in the vertical uh, differently uh, so that the essentially the hydrostatic relation for each constituent uh, will depend on its molecular weight. Uh, for many applications, the main uh, constituents will be in uh, up through the therms, thermosphere are nitrogen, oxygen, and now also free oxygen. And uh, if we had a perfectly calm atmosphere with nothing going on and allowed these different constituents to find their equilibrium levels, this would be called an aerostatic balance. And that would correspond to these red dashed lines where you'd see nitrogen increasing through the troposphere and stratosphere and then decreasing and 
uh, oxygen dropping off immediately. Um, well, in fact, that's not what happens. As we know, the uh, uh, nitrogen and oxygen are, are pretty much constant uh, throughout the you know, lowest 100 kilometers or so in the atmosphere. And that's because uh, eddy mixing and things of this nature are actually uh, mixing these uh, variations out on time scales that are faster than the transition relaxation to an aerostatic balance. And so, for example, if we just run a, uh, a resting atmosphere version of the model and allow the uh, these uh, aerostatic terms to come into balance with vertical mixing, we would get profiles similar to these uh, to the solid lines here. Uh, and if we look at an old paper here from Dickinson in, uh, in 84, in their upper atmosphere model, uh, you can see there's a semi-quantitative agreement in, the, in these profiles for the atmospheric constituents. Now, the reason those are important uh, in our, uh, just for even the model dynamics is, is that the thermodynamic coefficients, for example, the ideal gas count coefficient and heat capacity uh, depend directly on the, uh, on the different uh, concentrations of the atmospheric constituents where these size are, are mixing ratios and this capital M are, is the, the molecular weight. So for example, for this uh, temperature profile, which we've uh, actually taken from a, uh, a representative sounding in the Wacom X model, um, when we uh, allow these uh, constituents to come into balance, we see that the, uh, the ideal gas constant, for, for example, is increasing by about 60% as we get up into the upper thermosphere and heat capacity is increasing by about 30%. And these variations in the, in the uh, thermodynamic properties, they vary only with the mix mixing ratios of these atmospheric constituents. We also need to modify the thermodynamic equation that we have in the model. If we start up here with the uh, internal energy equation written in terms of, of temperature, we are, the equation we use in, uh, in MPAS is for the, essentially the flux form of potential temperature. So if we take the definition of potential temperature and differentiate it by combining this with the internal energy equation, that's what gives us the uh, the equation, the prognostic equation for potential temperature. And if, if Q, if any heating terms are ignored, what that typically means is that the time variation of, of, of theta, a substantial derivative is zero. However, because we have this kappa R over CP in the definition of theta, when we differentiate that, we now are picking up an additional term here which is the substantial derivative of this kappa with respect to time. So that adds an additional term in our uh, flux form version of the potential temperature and its prognostic equation. And this term is uh, numerically uh, pretty small, but it, it, it can have a significant effect on the, uh, on the flow. Okay, this is a slide that'll roll your eyeballs. Uh, this is essentially a, uh, a listing of, of all of the uh, terms in our uh, dynamical equations. And uh, I don't want you to uh, fret over trying to understand this, but I just wanna point out where these additional terms are popping up in the equations. I mentioned the including terms involving uh, Coriolis terms involving vertical velocity. That adds a couple of terms in the horizontal momentum equations circled here, and a couple of terms in the vertical momentum equation. Because of the large variation in pressure across the uh, depth of the domain, 
we find that we get more accurate treatment of the pressure gradients if we write them in terms of log pressure to find here that phi is d log p uh, because the vertical derivative of log p is, uh, is, is nearly linear, uh, whereas pressure itself is dropping off exponentially. Uh, to accommodate the molecular diffusivity and thermal conductivity, uh, we had these uh, diffusivity terms in the horizontal and vertical momentum equations, and then the, a thermal conductivity term uh, is added in the thermodynamic equation, in the theta equation. Five minutes. And <clears throat> we have uh, our now equation for atmospheric constituents, which in addition to transport have this second term, which uh, is tending the uh, constituents toward their aerostatic balance and this vertical eddy mixing term. Variations in those constituents, as I mentioned, affect the thermodynamic coefficients. And those come back to affect these dynamical equations in the ideal gas law and also in this extra term in theta. And so Sensi, that's the only place where they feed back into the dynamics. So in these, uh, in the dynamical equations, we're basically solving them using the same split explicit time integration uh, as we used in the, in the shallow atmosphere. I want to show you an uh, example or two from uh, our mountain waves, doing some simple mountain wave tests. Here we have uh, a stability profile that's associated with this temperature profile shown here, a constant 50 meter a second wind, use a bell-shaped mountain, and we're going to look at several different horizontal scales, 5, 20, 100 kilometers. Um, one thing that's interesting here is that it, these mountain waves, their amplitude tends to increase like the inverse square root of density. So in inviscid flow, they're going to increase in amplitude and overturn before they get anywhere near the upper atmosphere. So we have to add some uh, essentially vertical uh, eddy diffusivity terms, which maintain the amplitude of the wave at reasonable levels um, so that we can simulate uh, what happens as it goes into the upper atmosphere. Um, this is showing uh, results now. I want to emphasize what I'm showing first is no molecular viscosity or thermodynamicity because they would just kill off the wave and you wouldn't see anything. And so this is showing uh, results for a mountain half width of 100 kilometers here. Notice that the wave amplitude is all directly above the mountain, which is uh, above this little triangle here. And this is hydrostatic uh, and it's small enough in scale where the rotational, the Coriolis forces are small. So uh, it's just propagating up until right near the top, we have an absorbing layer. If I add, if we make it five times wider, now Coriolis effects start to become uh, significant or at least influencing the wave. And the wave energy now is turned downstream. So we get this downstream propagation of the wave. Uh, this is just showing for that case what the eddy diffusivity looks like and our perturbation gas, gas constant. So we're getting perturbations of the ideal gas constant are only about 1% of the, of, of the mean value. If we, at the smallest scale here, this is uh, showing a mountain uh, half width of 25 kilometers. <coughs> Now non-hydrostatic effects are important. And so we see this wave amplitude uh, turning downstream as the uh, upward propagation of wave energy is becoming more horizontal. Uh, this plot on the right shows if we turn on molecular viscosity and conductivity, you can see now the, the wave is totally absorbed before we get up above about 200 kilometers. In reality, oftentimes the wind in the upper thermosphere is, uh, gets a lot stronger. And so this shows a case where we have this wind increasing up to 300 meters a second. 
in the upper thermosphere. What this does is it makes the smaller scales much more hydrostatic. And I should mention that here we've turned on molecular viscosity and thermoconductivity because with that strong wind, the vertical wavelengths are becoming much larger, which means that the viscosity terms are much less effective in uh, damping them out. And so we see that the, at this smaller scales, the wave becomes evanescent and it can't even get into the upper uh, thermosphere. As we make the mountain wider, those non-hydrostatic effects have gotten weaker, but they're still evident. And now at our 500 kilometers, it's essentially hydrostatic uh, with these waves propagating to significant depths. So in summary, what we're seeing is that our, our height-based terrain following coordinates seems to work well. Uh, our, our split explicit finite volume numerics uh, appear to remain viable in our uh, deep atmosphere applications. I should mention we are solving these equations with double precision using full thermodynamic variables, not perturbation variables from the reference state. This large diffusivity and conductivity requires special implicit treatment. We're currently using ADI for that. Uh, we are getting some large acoustic noise in the upper atmosphere when we impulsively start up these mountain wave simulations and that may require some more special filtering. So I'll stop there and thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Joe, that was excellent. Um, by the way, what do you see the applications for, for this kind of capability? I mean, how do you see it being used you know, beyond, beyond research for applications? Well, the, uh, let's see, good there. In the, uh, Upper atmosphere thermospheric modeling, there's, there's two things that they're trying to do. First of all, they're trying to use a whole atmosphere approach so that they simulate the lower atmosphere and all the perturbations that are produced that propagate up into the uh, upper atmosphere. And also, they, it's important to have a non-hydrostatic capability. I mentioned that uh, because of this uh, viscosity, the vertical length scales tend to be much larger up there. And so you can have horizontal scales that are very large by our standards, yeah. but are still non-hydrostatic. And there really are no workable non-hydrostatic models uh, that uh, are uh, functional in the thermosphere. That's really interesting. Well, thank you. I think I think we're out of time. I think we got to move on to the next talk. So let's, let's transition over now. Okay, so we can let's see. Get Joe Olson's taking it or or Mike Mike Toys to do, doing this one, right? Yeah. Let's see. Uh, let why, me click why, why you go? PowerPoint. Should be able to share your screen. There we go. Ex excellent. Right, we can see it now. Okay. The next talk will be uh, given by Mike Toy, the Noah Rap Her Horographic Drag Suite Edition to Wharf. And and go ahead, please. all right. Uh, well, thanks for having me give this talk. It's uh, good to be here. Uh, the Rap Her is uh, our NOAA's operational regional weather prediction models uh, based on the WARF ARW dynamical core. In the current version, uh, we're, we've added some new features to the orographic drag parameterization, and these are now available to the WARF community uh, with the latest version 4.3 release. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at uh, NOAA GSL, uh, Global Systems Laboratory, uh, particularly, especially Joe Olson. Uh, who worked a lot with me on this. And I'll also like to acknowledge our um, uh, partners at uh, NCAR, uh, uh, Jamie, uh, Dave, Way, and Michael, uh, for help with uh, coding, getting this into the latest version of, of WARF, helping out with the code and so on. Okay, um, there we go. 
Oh, so a brief outline. Uh, I'll describe the OR graphic drag parameterizations, which are uh, in which there are four in this suite. Uh, two of them are the tra traditional gravity wave drag and low-level blocking, which were uh, uh, existed in the WARF model for a number of views, years. And there are two new additional schemes, uh, which are small-scale gravity wave drag and turbulent OR graphic form drag, uh, which we added uh, added to the uh, drag suite. Um, Let's see, so it's implemented in the latest uh, version of WARF, and there's just a little bit of work that needs to be done preparing some static or graphic data uh, by the WARF preprocessing system, which I'll go over, and some uh, just one or two WARF uh, nameless settings involved. And then I'll go over uh, results near the end. So um, just uh, continue on from. Uh, uh, from Joe's talk, uh, these deal with gravity waves that don't propagate up as, as high as uh, that J what Joe showed, but um, this is just a brief review of um, gravity waves as uh, imparted by uh, orography, by surface topography. So models uh, resolve these, and um, uh, the momentum fluxes, energy fluxes, propagate upwards uh, until they reach a point where the waves over, uh, overturn and break. Um, at that uh, level, uh, the uh, drag force is imparted. The force that the mountain applies to the uh, uh, atmosphere is actually applied up at these levels where the wave breaks. Uh, the wave stress or momentum flux is given by the co uh, average correlation between the zonal wind and vertical wind per uh, perturbations. And this flux is in newtons per square meter. So this uh, wave stress is constant uh, with height until the waves uh, reach a level where they break and then the wave stress uh, dies off, and where you have a divergence of the di divergence of the stress is where you have a drag force. Um, so the actual topography, there, of course, uh, grid models don't resolve all the topography. There's subgrid uh, topography, and these also can impart gravity waves, which aren't resolved by the model, and this is uh, causes a missing drag, or these. Uh, small scale gravity wave drags or small scale scale gravity waves break. Um, so we need to parameterize the wave stress from these unresolved waves. Uh, so this rho u prime w prime are what the parameterizations calculate as a function of height in each column, and where there's a divergence of this flux, uh, the subgrid scale uh, drag force is uh, imposed in the uh, momentum equations. So the uh, uh, Drag coefficient uh, scheme that's in, been in war for a number of years is based on these uh, three, mainly these three references, Kim and Harukawa, Kim and Doyle, Choi and Hong. And uh, these parameterizations are recommended for horizontal grid, re grid resolutions greater than five kilometers, uh, lower than, smaller than five kilometers, uh, with the typical static stabilities in the free atmosphere. Um, the, uh, the, it is not conducive to vertical propagation of these waves. So basically these are um, the good for resolutions uh, greater than about five kilometers. So the original WARF version uh, is drag scheme is activated by gravity wave drag opt equals one. The new GSL or Global Systems Laboratory drag suite version is activated by nameless option GWD opt equals three. So the two additional drag parameterizations that we've added are, uh, starting with the first one, uh, tur turbulent or graphic form drag based on Bellier's at our all 2004. Um, this is a uh, scheme which is uh, used in the ECMWF and a couple of other uh, uh, global models. Um, and what this is, this is not a, a gravity wave drag scheme. Uh, what it is is uh, a small scale perturbations or small scale topography induces uh, variations in the, in the pressure perturbations of turbulent eddies in such a way that the pressure perturbations are positively correlated with the slope of the terrain. And this imparts a um, opposing drag force. And the um, perturbations in topography down to below the kilometer level uh, can, uh, causes these, uh, this drag force. And this is useful in models uh, for grid route resolutions from many kilometers down to down to about one kilometer. The terrain uh, data that is used uh, is based on terrain that's filtered out 
uh, bandpass filter filter out the large perturbations uh, in topography such as large mountain ranges and also smaller than about two kilometers. So you have a bandpass um, subset of the topography uh, in phase space, uh, wave number space, that you use to calculate the standard deviation of the subgrid topography, which is then fed into the scheme. Um, the, the last, uh, the second new drag scheme that we've introduced is a small-scale gravity wave drag scheme uh, from these two publications. Uh, these account for high wave, high per, uh, static stability in typically nocturnal stable boundary layers in which gravity waves can be imparted by even smaller scale, hor smaller horizontal scale topography down to about a kilometer scale. So this, um, these waves, uh, this parameterization is useful for uh, down to the kilometer scale and um, the, uh, these waves don't propagate through the free atmosphere, they typically break uh, near the top of the boundary layer. So these, this drag force is uh, uh, basically in the lowest levels uh, within, imparted with it within the boundary layer, typically nocturnal, highly stable boundary layers. Um, so the RAP and HER uh, numerical weather prediction models, uh, operational at NOAA, has a, uh, a RAP uh, 13 kilometer, which covers all of North America and, and, and uh, other parts, a few, a couple other parts of a couple other continents. Um, this is using the full gravity wave drag physics, uh, all four schemes. The nested uh, regional th three kilometer convective allowing uh, model only uses the two new small scale form drag and small scale gravity wave drag uh, parameterizations. Um, Okay, so in terms of the new version of WARF, uh, this new GSL drag suite uh, is introduced in the physics module, uh, module BLGWDO underscore GSL. Um, the suite is activated by gravity drag opt equals three. Uh, new geographical input data is required uh, for the WARF preprocessing system. This can be downloaded from the uh, WARF user website. And um, under the uh, WPS graphical, geographical input data mandatory for specific applications, you download this set of files uh, from the orographic gravity wave drag data for GSL gravity wave drag section. And when you do that and run uh, geogrid.exe, your geoem.dnc uh, files will contain these additional uh, static variables. Um, but, uh, which are the same as uh, as the old ones, uh, standard deviation, convexity of subgrid topography, and a couple of uh, or, uh, orographic asymmetries and effective lengths. Uh, but there's two sets, one for the two sort of large scale uh, schemes and the other set for the small scale schemes. And then uh, to select which uh, which resolution of data you should specify? Um, it's the same guidance as in the gravity wave, as in the WARF user's guide for selecting static data for the gravity wave drag scheme, uh, which determines the resolution used in the geo data res variable in the GeoGrid name list record. Just uh, follow the same guidance as with the old gravity wave drag scheme, with the, with, I mean the traditional tra gravity wave drag scheme. And this is just a look at what. Um, the difference in these uh, two sets of data are for the standard deviation of subgrid topography. This is for the RAP domain at uh, 13 kilometers. Uh, the traditional wharf is on the left, uh, which would be used for uh, gra gravity of drag opt equals one. Um, the new GSL large scale gravity wave drag scheme uses a slight difference, a slightly different uh, form. What we what we do is we um, uh, detrend the topography. So we take out the slope of the resolved topography, uh, subtract the resolved topography from the high resolution topography, which is typically 30, 30 second uh, topography. And what you end up is really the true uh, subgrid scale uh, topography. So we take, about, take out any standard deviation of, of um, topography that is, re that, that is resolved and, and what, that, uh, what happens then is that the uh, variation, this uh, VAR LS, the standard deviation, is typically a little bit smaller than the standard deviation calculated from the undetrended uh, data. 
So that, that means that the gravity wave drag scheme will really uh, won't be as effective or, or useful or, or active in the Great Plains, let's say, or over Greenland, uh, where the topography is at 13 kilometers is really well resolved. And then the one on the right is the standard deviation used for the small scale uh, drag. Um, it uses a 30 second, it's based directly on a 30 second data that's been bandpass filtered. And at this, at 13 kilometers, the standard deviations tend to be a little bit stronger, a little bit uh, larger than uh, the, uh, that used for the large scale, which, which uses a two and a half minute. Um, uh, so we filtered out the smaller uh, variations, uh, which don't excite gravity, uh, large scale gravity wave. Okay, so the um, we made the model uh, the scheme a little more scale aware than the, than the traditional scheme um, has built an awareness of the horizontal grid spacing based on empirical tuning from the, the GFS uh, global forecast system uh, model and experiments with high resolution simulations. But the user is still free uh, to change the tuning parameters in the code if desired. Um, and any future updates that we make to these uh, default pa uh, parameters will be passed on to the WARF repository for future uh, versions of the WARF. Uh, the large scale gravity wave drag is automatic and blocking are automatically tapered down to zero at five kilometers. So the user doesn't have to uh, manually uh, turn, those off, turn, turn those schemes off. And likewise for the small scale gravity wave drag and form drag, those schemes are automatically tapered down at about by one kilometer spacing. So these new, uh, th these uh, four then schemes in, in the drag suite, the, the amount of drag that they impart for a typical uh, simulation, this is September 19th at 14 UTC. To get an idea of the, the relative strength of these, uh, we look here, this is Colorado, the surface stress with the large scale gravity wave drag. Uh, units are, um, are uh, new uh, newtons per square meter. And obviously over the mountainous terrain of Colorado, there's more uh, drag that's imparted than over the eastern plains. Uh, these are the uh, vertical profiles of the four schemes. The blue is the blocking, which only uh, is imparted in the lowest levels, the small scale gravity wave drag, also the lowest levels, the orange, orange plot. Um, and then uh, the form drag and the large scale gravity wave drag it, uh, imparts drag forces all the way through this troposphere and up into the, st the stratosphere. This is with the 13 kilometer wrap. Um, going down to the finer grid, uh, there is no contribution from large scale gravity wave drag or blocking, but the small scale and form drag still uh, are, provide a little bit of drag in the lower levels um, at a slightly less uh, a strength than in the 13 kilometer wrap. Okay, so. Looking at the uh, verification then uh, at some forecasts to see what the effects of adding uh, these uh, the, these new schemes. Um, this is a, uh, a reforecast from December, excuse me, February second through fifteenth. Um, I think it's based every uh, daily daily forecast or every twelve hours, excuse me, for a, a forecast. Uh, this is the twenty-seven hour forecast for wind, uh, Rayob verification. Uh, the RMSC, oh, the error with, with uh, we ran a whole bunch of different uh, cases with all the possible schemes, um, permutations. Five, five minutes. Okay, I should be done soon. Uh, turned on and off, but we'll just focus on three of them. Uh, one is with all the schemes um, turned off, so no subgrid topographic uh, parameterization. And that gives uh, the highest error, this uh, blue curve on the right. Um, turning on the tra two traditional large-scale schemes uh, brings lowers the RMSE to sort of this midpoint value, you know, decreases it by about a tenth or two tenths of a meter per second. And then uh, turning on these two new additional uh, small-scale schemes lowers the error in an additional about tenth or two tenths of a meter per second. So we do see uh, you know a gain in um, in accuracy. Uh, by uh, turning on these these um, uh, gravity wave drag schemes. In, in addition, uh, in terms of bias, wind speed bias, uh, with no drag scheme, it gives us the highest wind, wind bias, wind speed bias. Um, turning on the large scale 
uh, drag schemes lowers the bias by about a tenth of a meter per second, and then turning on the small scale uh, schemes further uh, lowers the bias by an, an additional amount. So we see some benefit at the 13 kilometer wrap of uh, these additional small scale schemes. Um, same thing with the surface winds, 10 meter winds. <clears throat> RMSE, the highest error is from the, uh, having no drag. Uh, lower, we see a lowering in the RMSE with the large scale and then a, even further lowering, significant lowering with the small scale uh, gravity wave drag schemes as well as with the bias. Uh, with the three kilometer her, uh, where we only just we basically just have the effects of the small scale gravity wave drag, gravity wave drag and form drag, um, the uh, benefits are a little more modest. Um, however, we do see a you know small benefit in the wind speed bias uh, with the uh, dra drag schemes uh, turned on um, versus uh, no with no parameterization. So we see some benefit at three kilometers uh, with the uh, wind speed profiles compared to verified with Rayobs, and also uh, uh, with the 10 meter surface winds, uh, slight change in the R, uh, improvement in the RMSE, and a slight improvement also in the wind speed bias, but a little more, little more modest with the three kilometer her than with the 13 kilometer wrap. So in sum summary, the Wharf Orographic Gravity Wave Drag plus blocking parameterization has been modified uh, for scale awareness and two new physical processes have been added, uh, form drag and small scale gravity wave drag. Uh, we see improved wind speed bias and RMS errors in the 13 kilometer wrap and modest improvements with the three kilometer uh, HER. Um, we're testing to see if additional improvement can be made uh, at this resolution. Uh, with, with the form drag and the small scale gravity wave drag. The GSL drag suite is included in the common community physics package, the CCPP library, and uh, this suite may evolve uh, into the unified forecast system drag suite um, uh, with time, continue, with continued updates and improvement as time goes along. And that's all I have, and there are references uh, provided in the last slide. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so very much. That was great. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, Shish Sharma, does the SSGWD drag also work for urban grid scale and subgrid topographic regions, especially in complex terrain? Um, we don't, th there's no additional, um, it would, but it only account for the topography within those uh, urban regions. We don't have um, uh, representation of buildings or 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 anything like that. This is just strictly topography. Right. Do you think that could be an effect if you had you know a city with big buildings and stuff like that? Could that be? An... I think so. But uh, there are some other uh, uh, wharf parameterizations. Of course, there there is an ur urban um, effects uh, parameterization. Uh, part of the uh, it's a boundary layer addition. Um, but that's you know something we could certainly consider. And another thing is forests as well. I mean, dra drag from sure. forests with trees that propagate you know sure. in multiple levels and so on. Okay, thanks a lot. To stay back on time, let's keep on going. I pre appreciate your presentation. Mm -hmm. And now we have the last presentation of this session. And if we could switch to that, and it looks like Bill Scamrock is giving that talk. I so. am, and here we go. I will okay, share good. my screen. So I want to share your screen. Uh, the last talk of the session will be MPAS Atmosphere and SEMA and CSM CAM uh, preliminary results. Bill, go ahead. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, so let me bring this, this session to a close, talking about what's coming in the future with MPAS and the ability to run it within an Earth system model. Uh, and this is part of a project uh, that goes under the name of SEMA here at NCAR, the System for Integrated Modeling of the Atmosphere. And I want to show some results from some early testing at climate scales, but we're moving on to, to more weather scales shortly. Uh, and also I'm gonna talk a little bit about a related project that I want to let everyone know about. And this is NSF funded, but is led by a group outside of NCAR, uh, Dave Randall up at CSU. And that's to bring the GPU enabled version of MPAS into CESM, couple it with other GPU enabled components and run it on a single four kilometer MPAS mesh. 
for climate purposes, but also for weather purposes. So I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, that project has just started. So SEMA, System for Integrated Modeling of the Atmosphere, the idea behind it is to bring together the atmospheric modeling capabilities in NCAR under essentially one modeling system. And this system is, is essentially CESM. We had a workshop on it last year and I announced that workshop geez, just before it was gonna happen at the last Wharf and Pass workshop. That occurred at the end of June, 2020. There is a, a vision statement that came out of that. There's also a web page for SEMA now that I'll show later on, but essentially, what we're trying to do is bring together the atmospheric modeling technology within NCAR, within CESM. It's not a single system per se, but it's a configurable system that can be used for climate, weather, chemistry, geospace applications. For example, the advances that Joe talked about with the deep atmosphere uh, is going to be brought into this and used within that because we can couple with those, uh, those other models for the the ionic uh, component of that in the upper atmosphere. Um, our idea is to try to bring this all together and have a minimal set of components that can couple all these needs. Now, in terms of MPAS, the important aspect of bringing this into SEMA, bringing it into CESM, is that it's being brought in as what's called a managed external component. And the mechanism that was developed by the software engineering group within CESM to do that, which means that when you build MPAS and CESM, it is pulling directly from the MPAS repository that we build our single source version of MPAS from that you've seen a lot of results from so far in this workshop. So, so we have a, a single source coming from the MPAS development repository, release repository, that's brought into CESM when you say build MPAS and build. So essentially this framework uh, is depicted here and the MPAS is one of the dynamical cores. There's others, there's the FC core, the FD3 core has been brought in. Uh, right now, we're testing with CAM physics. We're waiting for an interface to allow us, uh, the CCPP interface to allow us to start bringing in some more of MPAS physics. But the important aspect here is that now we get access to all these other components in a coupled system. Importantly, for example, an ocean model. Uh, in this case, MOM is the supported ocean model, or will be in the near future, supported ocean model. A wave model, sea ice, land ice, uh, a new land model, the CTSM, this community-based one, rivers model. You get all of that through this coupler that recognizes the MPAS mesh, uh, and, and everything is there. Uh, we also have a data simulation component that's under development. Right now, DART will work with this at least in some configurations, it will work with MPAS, and they're looking for ways to bring in, for example, JEDI. So that's, in a nutshell, uh, what's going on. So we have MPAS in there, we've done the port, brought it in as an external component, and now we're testing it. The first set of tests that we're doing are effectively for climate applications, because there's a need to look at the dynamical cores that are available to choose the next dynamical core for CESM3. CESM2 with the current release, CESM3 is many years off, but they're in the process of looking at dynamical cores. And what you're seeing on this slide is, on the right is a plot of the, the speed of these cores running an aquaplanet, aquaplanet simulation for a month. So essentially, Full physics is on. The only thing you don't have is topography. And on the, uh, the y-axis simulated years per day, uh, larger is better. And what you're looking at is what these different dynamical cores in this configuration are producing. And as you see, the MPAS dynamical core in its aquacolor color is producing integration rates very similar to the other cores. And it's only when you get out to very, very high processor counts that it starts falling off. And the SE core, for example, the spectral element core was designed to be able to essentially run on one element per thread. So it scales way out. Uh, the, the typical workplace for a lot of the work done in climate is this vertical line you see in that plot. It has about 25 columns per thread. For those of you who run, for example, wharf regularly, if you run 25 columns per thread, you know you're gonna see degraded performance 
Impasse, the degradation is a little, uh, we can go a little bit further pushing the parallelization and impasse than we can in wharf. And this is depicted here in this slide. Uh, the other thing we're interested in is, for example, chemistry. So can we transport large numbers of species uh, with a given dynamical core? Here's the plot. Uh, impasse is again in this aqua color, but the triangles aren't filled here. Here, lower is better. So this is time to solution. Or it turns out this is a better clinic, a moist better clinic, idealized uh, better clinic wave case. Uh, lower is better. And as you can see, the impasse dynamical core at this one, nominally one degree resolution, is actually faster than the other dynamical cores. Even though those other dynamical cores are hydrostatic, uh, there are some reasons for that. Uh, but I think it, it's telling you that it's scaled out. We can go to 500 tracers with 45 columns per thread, a, a small number of columns in a given task, a given processor, and we scale fine. So MPAS is looking fine. In terms of the properties of the dynamical core, here's an example of injecting the slotted cylinder uh, around the, the sphere in one of these test cases. It's just a tracer. Uh, MPAS, the mechanisms that we have in the transport scheme, which we also have in WARF, the monotonic option, which is often used in chemistry, both in Empaths and wharf, uh, it does what it should do. For example, in the slotted cylinder case, where the maximum value should be one and the minimum value should be 0.1, it maintains the correct maximum and minima. And you'll notice that some of the other dynamical cores do not do that because of the nature of how they're constructed. So, so you get the same properties you would expect of Empaths in a standalone version when we bring it into CESM. And finally, there's also th this test result of looking at the correlation between three tracers and the transport schemes at MPASS that give you similar results to the other schemes in this regard. There's nothing that stands out that would say that what MPASS is doing is any poorer, or for that matter, any better, at least on this one degree mesh uh, than the other cores. So that's the... Uh, the idealized test, the simpler test. We've also done multi-year simulations, uh, both in terms of this, this F2000, what they call it a comp set, it's a case where they keep running the, the year 2000 over and over. So 2000 ends and it just begins again in terms of the sea surface temperatures and, and things like that. Uh, the MPAS results compared with the finite volume core result. This is not FP3. This is the finite volume core that's been running in CESM for 20 something years. Here's the zonal winds. You're looking at a pop. I think it's more interesting to look at the difference between MPAS and that FB result at the bottom. You could see that for this five year average of this F2000 test case, we're producing somewhat weaker jets in the stratosphere, slightly stronger jets in the troposphere with uh, weaker easterlies in, in the upper uh, stratosphere here. Uh, but this is all within the, uh, the expected variance when we look at other die cores and other tests. And some of this we are expecting we're going to tune a little bit to bring these a little closer together. Uh, looking at another result, for example, the temperature here, uh, again, looking at the difference, stratosphere is a little bit warmer in impasse, the troposphere is a little bit cooler. That might explain some of the differences you're seeing in the wind given the thermal wind balance. So again, this is potentially tunable and we're gonna be looking at this a little bit further. And finally, if we look at the cloud differences, so this is where moisture is showing up in the atmosphere. Uh, this is a cloud fraction. You can see uh, we've got differences in primarily in the polar regions. Um, again, cloud and moist processes, th these are major tuning parameters in CAMP6 physics and we're going to be doing that in, in the near future, or a number of people are gonna be doing it, not me, um, but looking at this as a potential, a dynamical core candidate for going forward in CESM3. And this is all with CAM6 physics. So this is not with the MPAS wharf uh, shared physics. So essentially we have a, uh, we're, we're bringing things together we right now are running that nominally one degree mesh because that's the workhorse mesh for the climate applications, but we are now bringing in 60, 30, 50, and those 15 to three kilometer meshes. 
so we can get down to convective permitting scales. A lot of this is developing the workflows for initializing the land model, the topography, uh, the gravity wave drag, and the mesh mapping so that we can use that coupler between the other CSM components. Uh, we also expect to encounter problems with the CAMP6 physics at convection permitting resolutions. We already see them in mesoscale resolutions at simulations with the other die cores. Uh, and also, CAMP6 physics doesn't have any scale or physics, so we're very we're going to be looking very closely at what we need to bring in to enable these variable resolution meshes and to enable convection permitting resolutions within this earth system model. We expect to have a release of this sometimes this fall. Importantly, this release will also be accompanied by a tutorial. I can tell you from experience, because I'm running this myself, this system, CESM, is an order of magnitude more difficult to run than either a war for impasse. And that's because it has a coupler that you have to go through. It has all these components. There's just so many more things you need to be aware of and you need to configure, especially if you have a specific application in mind. So I think a tutorial uh, is gonna be almost absolutely necessary for people who have no experience running in CESM for them to run impasse. Finally, there's a web page you can go to. Here's the link for it. I'll show it again. That has a lot more information about what's going on within the broader project. So I want to conclude here talking a little bit about a related project called Earthworks. This is being led by Dave Randall. It also has Jim Hurdle up at CSU. And there are a number of us at NCAR. The leads are Andrew Gettleman up at CGD, Rich Lawson, Sithel, and myself. And what we're doing is we're bringing the GPU enabled version of MPAS into CESM. It's going to be brought in, or it will be brought in just like the current MPAS is being brought in now in testing. Uh, and we're going to couple this with GPU enabled MPAS Ocean and other components on the MPAS mesh. Our target is to use the nominally four kilometer uniform MPAS mesh over the entire globe for atmosphere, ocean, land ice, sea ice, land, everything. And our goal on the GPU-based machines at the end of this project, which is 2025, is to be able to run at about 0.5 simulated years per day. That's about a factor of 200 greater real time. So you can see in terms of weather prediction, this is about what you need for NWP. Uh, and this is what we're looking for for climate here. As I showed on, on a previous slide, uh, the components uh, are going to all talk through the CMEPS mediator, the coupler. Uh, we're gonna use MPAS Atmosphere. That's coming from MQ, from the MPAS project itself, leveraging the work from IBM and the weather company and the other people that have worked with us to bring this GPU capability online. Um, we're gonna use MPAS Ocean. That's coming in from Los Alamos and DOE that's currently being used by E3SM in which a GPU enabled version exists. In, in addition, we've got a sea ice model and a land ice model that will also come in, also GPU enabled. We're going to be using some version of the CLM. I believe it's going to be the CTSM, uh, so, so, but it's the land model that comes along with a CESM. And of course, we're using these couplers. Uh, this is the Nuopsy coupler. In this regard, we're using the same mesh on all the components. So the coupler is just going to be passed through. Uh, we, we're doing this because we think this is crucial to be able to get to those integration rates, that half a simulated year per day integration rate that's our target in essentially by the end of 2025. We've already done some back of the envelope calculations based upon the impasse atmosphere because that's going to be the critical component. The ocean will take some time, but it's a smaller part of the total integration time, even at four kilometers. And so and when we look at what we can do now on a 10 kilometer mesh, we already have testing and scaling on existing hardware, and we can extrapolate down to four kilometer meshes. We're holding our, our fingers crossed, extrapolating what we expect hardware to be able to do in the next four or five years. We're hoping to get a speed up there. Uh, we're hoping to get a speed up by going from single, from double to single precision uh, within CESM. So, we think we have a chance of meeting our target integration rate. 
And of course, I don't have to explain to you what we're going to see in the atmosphere when we go to four kilometers. All of us in this community are pretty familiar with that. For the ocean, however, we're going to get an eddy resolving model. We're going to get those energetic eddies. We're going to get deep convection, the effect of bottom topography, gravity waves in the ocean. We're going to see some estuaries. We're going to see a lot there. This is going to bring a lot to weather, whether one's looking at tropical cyclones or other phenomena, for example, subseasonal to seasonal. That's what I'm thinking about in terms of weather. Now that we're going to bring a coupled ocean model in, in addition to a wave model and other components, we're going to have a very powerful system to bring to a lot of our weather research applications that we have now. There is an Earthworks webpage, and I give the link here uh, with some of the people involved and, and where we're going. Again, we've only started, we're less than a year into this, and right now we're leveraging what's being done in SEMA, and soon we're gonna be starting to bring in the GPU versions of these codes uh, to uh, bring the, the full system into play. Uh, as you can imagine, one of the big components is bringing in physics and getting GPU versions of those modified CAM CESM physics uh, to work. So there's a lot of work for us to do, but we've, we've got a good start already. So just to, to summarize here, I, I've mentioned about the SEMA development with MPAS in it. I expect we will have initial release this fall along with a tutorial. We will be announcing this through the ORF uh, emails and through the MPAS email group. So you'll see it there in addition to the CAM CESM group. And I just wanted to bring your attention to Earthworks, which is bringing GPU capabilities to all of this within the Earth system model. Uh, and that project is quite a bit further out that I think you'll see potential releases. You'll be able to access data sets, et cetera, as we develop them. But ultimately, it's going to be four or five years before I think uh, collaborators are going to be able to run with this. Uh, but I think data sets will be available earlier. So thank you, and that concludes my presentation. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Very exciting. So, Bill, one big question is those of us who are running impasse and want to have an interactive ocean model, what's the fastest route forward for us right now? Well, we are going to have access to, I think we're going to be able to release that access to an ocean model this fall okay. because oh. there's... That, that shouldn't be a problem. Now, now the issue will be how high a resolution we're going to be able to run in that ocean, because the ocean modeling group up in in CESM, they're most familiar running at a degree, and and I don't think that's what we want to bring a lot of our weather applications to. We want to be able to get the high resolution. I'd say tenth of a degree is our starting point. It, it's not obvious that we're going to be able to offer that with reasonable initializations of that ocean model at that resolution this fall. I think that's going to be maybe perhaps another year out. I mean, could you run a coarser ocean model with the higher resolution atmospheric model? I, I think you can. And, and I think the question that you have to ask yourself is, does that suit the needs of my application? Right. Okay. Uh, there's a question uh, by Kay Ch uh, Chun. Uh, uh, for the four kilometer resolution, the deep convection can be fine. How about turbulence related to the shallow convection? Oh, geez, um, that, that's a big problem. So, so if you run at four kilometers, I think you have to maintain that shallow convective parameterization. Yeah. Now that doesn't necessarily give you all the turbulence influence one would want. So, mm -hmm. so for example, the scale where NT the scheme, yeah. or the scale where it grow freitas, it's the it's the deep convection that shuts off, not the shallow. Right, right. you need it there. But but this is an unanswered question of of what are we missing at this kind of one to four kilometer range yeah. in our our convective realizations, and and I think everybody knows that we're missing something, but we don't have good parameterizations to fill that gap yet. Right, right. Okay, well, I think we'll end this session there unless there's any other questions and uh, I'll pass it back up to Wei. Yeah, that's, that's really all for today. And thanks for all the speakers and the chairs. Uh, we ended up almost on time today, so thank you. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow at uh, nine o'clock. Uh,
Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.